Supreme Court justices, and more. Order your C-SPAN 2009 Congressional Directory. It's only $16.95 online at cspan.org slash products or call 1-877-ON-C-SPAN. On Wednesday, the House Rules Committee discussed amendments to the fiscal 2010 budget resolution. Several groups, including the Congressional Black Caucus and the Republican Study Committee, offered alternative budget proposals. This is three hours. Committee will please come to order. We're here today for further consideration of H. Conrad's 85. The concurrent resolution on the budget for the year 2010. I'm happy to welcome the distinguished chair of the Budget Committee, Mr. Spratt, and the committee ranking member, Mr. Ryan. And as you know, always you can submit your statement uh, and, and uh, summarize if you choose, and, uh, but it's up to you, Mr. Spratt. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Am I you're fine. Okay. I'll be very brief. We have prepared a resolution which we think is a commendable piece of work. I have taken it from place to place, person to person in our caucus on the Democratic side. It has solid support, support so solid that when we put it to a vote in the committee markup, every Democratic member voted for it. And for that matter, on 30 different amendments, we had solid support among our ranks. Basically, we first deal with the deficit because I think it is a compelling issue, particularly in today's situation. The deficit this year will be an unprecedented trillion seven hundred fifty-two billion dollars, according to OMB, a trillion eight hundred twenty-five billion, according to CBO. Obviously, we don't, in a recession, expect to cut the deficit by a significant amount because you're swimming upstream. But deficits at that level are simply unsustainable. And unjustifiable, and we've got to do something to have a five to ten year glide path to bring the deficit back to a reasonable level. What we would propose to do in our budget, which is a five year budget, for that matter, every deficit reduction budget that has been successful over the last 20 years has been a five year budget, not a ten year budget. Graham Robin Hollings, the Bush Budget Summit, the BBA, the Balanced Budget Agreement in 1997, they were all five year projections. We have over five years proposed to cut the deficit from a trillion eight to five hundred and sixty eight billion dollars. That is still not an acceptable number, but it is vastly superior to a trillion eight. And that much reduction over that period of time constitutes about two thirds of the outstanding deficit. Let me say two things with respect to the deficit we're confronting. To a large extent this is a structural deficit left over from the spending and taxing policies of the Bush administration. It's the inheritance of the current administration, Mr. Obama's inheritance, but we've got to deal with it. We can lament the fate we found ourselves, the hand that's been dealt us all day long, but the bottom line is we've got to deal with it. And in terms of dealing with the deficit, I think we deal with it squarely over that first five-year period of time. Secondly, notwithstanding deficits, the president has said I don't think our children's education should wait on us to get our books straightened out. So this budget is strong on education. It will have reserve funds that will permit us to do health care reform, expanding health care to those 46 million Americans who don't have it. And it will also help us do clean climate and uh, alternative energy legislation. These so-called reserve accounts are all deficit neutral. They're big objectives, big priorities of the current administration, but they are all, by the president's sole dictation, reserved. They're all deficit neutral. They will not add to the bottom line of the deficit because you cannot implement them until they're fully paid for or until you've identified other things that will be cut that have a commensurate amount of spending authority behind them. I think we've got a good resolution. And I think we uh, can have a good uh, and, and forthright debate on the House floor tomorrow. Uh, you're making order in the traditional fashion. The, uh, not only, of course, our Republican colleagues from across the aisle, but uh, the alternative resolutions in the House of Representatives mm -hmm. on our side of the aisle 
who would like to have an opportunity to present their case. So I submit the uh, resolution to you in the hopes that you'll approve it and, uh, and put it in order for consideration, general debate tonight and full debate tomorrow and voting on each of the alternatives for the close of business tomorrow. Right, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much, Mr. Spratt. Mr. Ryan. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good nice afternoon. to be with you again today, nice colleagues. Um, I won't uh, take on too long because uh, I know you have a busy day ahead of you and you've got other witnesses to testify. What I'll do is I'll just go to page 39 in our budget that we released today and just read through the comparison, the side by side, just so you get an idea of the differences between our two approaches, between our two budgets. Uh, to begin with, we just believe that the chairman's mark and the president's budget spends far too much money, borrows far too much money, and taxes far too much money. Let me go through a quick summary of the differences between our budget. Um, their budget uh, has $1.8 trillion deficit in the first year, $9.3 trillion of additional uh, deficits over the 10 years. Deficit equals 5.7% of GDP by 2019. Our deficit starts at $1.7 trillion. Uh, deficits are $3.3 trillion lower over the 10-year period, and the deficits fall below 3% of GDP over the 10-year period. The debt. Chairman's budget doubles the debt in over five years and triples over in, in just a little over 10 years. The de debt equals 82.4% of GDP. Ours borrows $3.6 trillion less, resulting in a 65.1 GDP ratio. It's a pretty important ratio. Total spending. Chairman's mark. Spending nearly doubles, rising from $2.983 trillion to about $5.1 trillion in 2019. Spending rises to 24.5, which is about 4 percentage points higher than the historical average size for our government. Our budget spends $4.8 trillion less throughout the 10-year period. The size of our government is at 20, falls to 20.7 percent of GDP, which is about the historic average. Discretionary spending. This is where we have a big disagreement. Uh, this budget, uh, theirs, Increases total discretionary spending by 6.5% in 2010. And just increases non-defense spending by 9%. Uh, in contrast, family income increases by 1.3% this year. And inflation is projected to be about 1.2% in 2010. Uh, we freeze non-defense, non-veteran spending for five years and then allow moderate increases throughout that. Obviously, there's difference of opinions, and that's one area where we have big differences. Entitlement spending. This is something we have to be very serious about. These entitlement programs are growing themselves right into extinction. The sooner we tackle this problem, the better off everyone in America is going to be. If we don't start reforming these entitlement programs, right now if we do, we can say to those who are in and near retirement, those people who are 55 and above, who are expecting certain benefits, who are counting on them, we can make sure that they can count on those if we reform them now. But if we delay these entitlement reforms, if we push it off, every year it's about three or four trillion dollars, deeper in debt we go. For every year we delay entitlement reforms, it won't be so. We're not gonna be able to hold harmless those people in and near retirement. So the moral obligation, we think, is to begin to reform these entitlement programs so we can save these entitlement programs. If you allow the bankruptcy to occur in these programs, which is coming soon, within the 10-year budget window of this budget, then automatic benefit cuts kick in, and that's not in anyone's interest. This budget, the, the chairman's budget, increases entitlements by about $1.4 trillion over 10 years. We slow the average annual growth rate in mandatory spending from 5.3% to 3.9%. Over the long term, the increase in Medicare's unfunded liabilities under this budget, of the chairman's budget, goes from $36 trillion to $50 trillion. There's nothing to address the insolvency of Medicare and Social Security. Uh, spending deficits and debt begin to spiral out of control by 2030, before my kids are even my age and they eventually drag down the U.S. economy. The debt exceeds 100% of the gross domestic product of this nation by 2030. We begin the reforms now. We gain control of our debt, which never exceeds 75% of GDP, and we show a pathway to get our debts taken care of so we can leave the next generation better off. On taxes, we again disagree. This budget increases taxes by $1.5 trillion. Taxes on energy, taxes on small businesses, taxes on the very assets that make up our pension funds, our 401k plans, our college savings plans. We think that's bad for economic growth. We think it's bad to do it anytime, but especially in a recession. So we don't do that. We propose pro-growth tax policies. We propose capping taxes so small businesses can compete in the global economy. We propose taxing our businesses at the international worldwide average rate instead of the second highest rate in the world. Because we're in the global economy these days, the problem we have is when we tax our employers and our jobs a lot more 
than our competitors tax theirs, we lose jobs. And so we want to make sure we keep jobs in America, make our companies more competitive. So we address that as well. And in an effort to get the savings back that everybody's lost, in an effort to get the savings back that the people have lost in their pensions, their 401ks, their college savings plans, mm -hmm. let's repeal the capital gains tax through 2010. That's the best thing you can do to put a floor price in equities and get these things back. The chairman's mark increases the capital gain tax by 33%. That's not going to help us get people's savings back. That's not going to help us get the market back and replenish those savings that people have lost that so many seniors are depending upon. Energy, again, difference of opinion. We don't believe the cap and trade is the way to go. We do something differently. We say let's open up our, our natural gas and our oil fields for domestic exploration. I know that's a controversial issue. We think we can do it in an environmentally safe and sensitive way. And we dedicate the revenues to a clean energy trust fund to get ourselves off of foreign oil and onto clean energy into the highway trust fund for infrastructure and a deficit reduction. Estimates show us that those three trust funds could each get as much as $23 billion a year by tapping into our own energy resources which helps lower the price of gas, natural gas, home heating, and makes us less dependent on foreign oil. Defense and Veterans Affairs. These are the things that we think are the primary responsibility of the federal government when it comes to discretionary spending. And so uh, we actually add uh, to the defense line in this, and we actually agree with the chairman on his mark on, on Veterans Affairs, which was in excess of the president's budget. So that's a quick summary of, of what our plan does. It's a different direction. Um, I think it's a good idea that we give the American people very bright and clear choices. Um, we're very critical of, of the chairman's budget, of the president's budget, of the majority's pathway. And that's fine. That's what two parties do. And I think it's our obligation that if we're going to criticize the pathway that they are taking, that we put up our own ideas. We put up our own plan. And that's exactly what we're doing. We think our plan is the better way to go. We think our plan is a way to do four basic things. Fulfill the mission of health and retirement security in this country. Get our debt and spending under control. Make sure that we can grow this economy and can be competitive in the global economy. And do one fourth thing that I think is the most important thing of them all. Leave the next generation better off. Every generation in this country has taken that responsibility very seriously. They've tackled the challenges confronting them so that the next generation is better off. I sincerely believe if the majority's budget comes to pass and comes to be, that we will sacrifice and sever that legacy, that we will consign the next generation to an inferior standard of living. And I think that's wrong. And that's why we're proposing to go a different direction. And with that, Madam Chair, I just appreciate your indulgence, and I hope you'll make our substitute in order, which I expect you will. Thank expect you. so. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Mr. McGovern? Uh, first, I want to thank you both for being here. I have the uh, privilege of uh, serving on the Budget Committee as well. and I. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Chairman Sprague, who I think is probably the finest chairman, excluding you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Why Sprague? One of you. You said one of. You said one of. Uh, He's coming along nicely. <laughs> one of his two favorites. And um, but it's, 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 it's really, it's, it's been an interesting educational experience, and it's been great to serve with Mr. Ryan. I, I admire his intellect and his, uh, his, and his commitment to his principles. I disagree with him on... 99.9 percent, .9%, but except we, we do agree on that. But I, uh, uh, but it's it's, it's it's an incredible committee to be on, and I want to commend Mr. Ryan for you know for coming up with a budget with numbers. I mean, I it's better than the pamphlet that was passed out uh, last week as uh, that was supposed to be the budget. So I, I appreciate that, um, Mr. Chairman Sprout. I just want to say that um, uh, I'm 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 proud to support the Democratic budget. Um, I think it's a budget with a conscience. Um, it will invest uh, in health care, um, and it will not only invest, it will ref help re us reform health care. I mean, that's the goal. When you, want to get these, when you want to get these entitlements, part of it is in reforming the system. We don't want the same old, same old. I appreciate the investments in education and energy independence. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it, it's a budget that expects big things uh, uh, and big changes you know, from our government. It's, it's not business as usual. It's not the same old, same old. And, um, and I think that's what people voted for. Um, so I, um, uh, I look forward to supporting it on the floor. I would, I would say to Mr. Ryan that, that my problem with your budget is I honestly believe it will not only be bad for my children uh, in terms of uh, what kind of legacy we will leave, I think it will, it will be bad for people right now. 
Uh, some of the cuts, I think, are, are pretty deep, and I, I think would, would hurt a lot of people. But having said that, we get at least two choices here. We'll have it out on the floor uh, tomorrow and uh, be able to debate all the facts. But uh, I do want to say, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, it, it has been a privilege to serve on the Budget Committee, and, uh, and, and, and the markups are something I would like to do without. I mean, it's an all-day affair to mark up this budget. But, uh, but uh, it's been it's been great to serve with both of you. So thank you. I look forward to the debate tomorrow. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Let me the outset say uh, you, Madam Chair, are my only chairman, and so I don't have the kind of choice that Mr. McGovern. Does that mean I'm your please. favorite? Absolutely. <laughs> because you're my only chairman is the reason that you're my favorite. Uh, I think. Uh, let me say that um, thanks to both of you. And as I listen to uh, to Mr. McGovern. Uh, engage in this exchange on agriculture subsidies. I'm reminded that just a few minutes ago we were on the floor debating this issue and Mr. McGovern said that our budget, the substitute that we're providing, in fact cuts funding for food stamps and it cuts funding for, what was the other thing you said other than food stamps? Medicare. Medicare, that, well, you, but you were talking specifically in the agriculture Nutrition field. Program. Yeah, nutrition programs and food stamps. And I mean, I guess I'd just begin by asking, do we cut food stamps and nutrition we, programs? We rescind uh, portions in the stimulus bill, but this program just got a 45% spending increase just last year. So there was a 45% spending increase that went in, and so the only thing that we touch is the so-called stimulus bill that came forward. That's right. And the other thing that I found very interesting is we talked in that debate at the end. Of course, I'm happy to yield. Of course, I'm happy to We're not cutting. We're freezing spending. Yeah. There's $20 billion worth of uh, food stamp funding and the stimulus package, right. which is significant. The part because yeah, no, food security and hunger has gone up in the United States significantly. You received that in the budget, so that's yeah. money that would be eliminated. But there was a 45 percent. No, if I could reclaim my time, let me just say there was a 45 percent increase in the level of spending for nutrition and food stamps. And we all acknowledge that there is a problem there. But again, to me, it's very. I, I think that it's very shrill to engage in this debate, this class warfare, arguing that somehow those of us who've come forward with an alternative like this are in a position where we're saying we want to hurt those who have to rely on food stamps and nutrition programs when in fact that is not the case. I, I want to say that um, also if you look at this issue of economic growth, and you went through, uh, I mean, I'm sorry I missed your, your, uh, your comments, Mr. Spratt. I was with uh, one of my uh, great constituents who is a small business woman. She has a, 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 an institution called the Fashion Institute for Design and Merchandising, and she was just talking about the challenges that we are facing as a country moving ahead with encouraging individual initiative and responsibility because she has 8,000 students in the school, and she's very concerned about their future, as was just uh, outlined in, in the concern that you had, Paul, for future generations. But let me say that the issue of economic growth is key. When Mr. McGovern and I were just uh, managing the debate on the floor a little while ago, we both agreed on the need to encourage economic growth. And the sense that somehow dramatically expanding the size and scope and reach of the federal government, doubling the national debt in five years and tripling it in 10 years, how that could possibly generate economic growth is just beyond me. And I think that and again, Mr. McGovern in that debate referred to the fact that what we did in 2001 and 2003 in response to the economic recession that we were facing in the early part of this decade, the corporate scandals, and the aftermath of September 11th, I believe played a role in sustaining the economic growth through that 55-month period of time. And that was described by Mr. McGovern as the same old, same old failed policies. And I think that what we should be doing is we should be focusing on zeroing out capital gains, which I laud. I, 15 years ago, established the bipartisan, bicameral, zero capital gains tax caucus. And I've talked with you, Mr. Chairman, on this capital gains issue and the need to, to reduce that. And I know you've, you've offered some very thoughtful recommendations to me on that. But I think that that kind of action, although who has capital gains today anyway? What we need to do is we need to encourage a growth policy so that there will be capital gains uh, for which people can, in fact, uh, have an opportunity to have uh, some encouragement to move ahead. But economic growth, I think, is something that we, we need to realize is the critical component here. And coupling that with this notion of debt reduction, making sure that our future generations are there, and 
as is done with this budget substitute, providing for those very serious societal needs that are out there today to completely pull the rug out from underneath this argument that somehow uh, those of us who come forward with an alternative that encourages growth and reduces the size and scope of government want to hurt those who are most in need, which is the furthest thing from the truth. I mean, is that a correct assessment? Yeah, I, I would simply say it. we believe in having a safety net. A safety net's important. Uh, we need a safety net that's sustainable. And so let me tell you a few things. If you don't fix entitlements, the safety net goes bankrupt. You need to have a vibrant, growing economy, private sector jobs, producing tax revenues to support the safety net. And so I'll tell you one thing our budget does. Our budget actually improves the safety net for Social Security. Right now, there are senior citizens who are living under the poverty level because their Social Security payments don't even get them up to the poverty level. We l raise those benefits so that no person on Social Security is underneath the poverty level. We want to repair the holes in the safety net, but we want to make sure that we have a society where there's a safety net that helps people who are down on their luck, who cannot help themselves, but we don't want to transform this safety net into a hammock whereby able-bodied people are drained into a life of government dependency that drains them of their ability to achieve their potential. And we've seen in the past a generational cycle of that, which was addressed then in 1996 and 1997, mm -hmm. when we stepped forward and really, in large part, brought an end to the generational cycle. And we have all kinds of anecdotes, anecdotes to which we can point where people have indicated uh, consistently that for the first time, to be the first member in generations of a family to get off of that cycle of dependence right. has been one of the greatest things that has happened to them. I remember, uh, you know, just when we worked on that in the mid to late 1990s, hearing the stories of people who have been so grateful for the fact that they have been incentivized to seek jobs rather than relying on that, uh, on that pattern that had gone on for so many members of their family. I would simply say the most humane, the most compassionate thing is a paycheck, not a government check. Absolutely. Of course, I'm happy to yield to my friend. I agree with you. Uh, a paycheck is what people want. The problem, and uh, just to get to your point, Mr. Dreyer, is that uh, uh, you've had your chance, and here we are. Uh, we're in the worst ec economic crisis since the Great Depression. And a lot of people in my district, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in your district are without jobs. They don't want a handout. Yes, yeah, so we, they, 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 we want to create those jobs. Right, we and, want to get and, and growth so again. And we, and the, here's the philosophical difference. Well, let me, let me reclaim my time. By, right? let me, by investing in some of these new technologies. Right. And that's exactly what we're doing. And that's exactly that what we're doing. If I could reclaim my time, I would say to my friend, that is the whole focus of our budget package, to encourage long-term private sector economic growth. Because the notion of saying somehow that this dramatic increase in the size and scope and reach of government is going to create job opportunities is to me beyond the pale. We know at best they would be temporary and the debt that is created exacerbates the potential for long-term job growth. I'll just, and so, sure. I'll just say a couple of things. Um, we estimate that our bill in just, uh, in, by 2014 will create 2.1 million more jobs than the chairman's mark will. We looked at all the studies. And a new study from Stanford and some German economists, Kogan and Taylor, uh, suggests that the multiplier effect of the stimulus legislation is less than a dollar. Meaning for every dollar we spend here and borrow, we create less than a dollar's worth of jobs. Mm -hmm. But what I find is interesting is the Romer, uh, Christina Romer, the president's top economic advisor, has a great study that she and her husband put out at Berkeley right. that shows the multiplier effect of the kinds of stimulus we're talking about are 2.3 to 3, meaning for every dollar we invest in our policy, you get 2.3 to 3 jobs. Well, the so, so we believe we're using sound, reliable economic data, you look, you're looking at what worked in history to get jobs back in this economy. We obviously had disagreements about that. But we believe the facts and the evidence back up the approach we're trying to and do. The Romer, and the Romer study uh, was one that we raised during the debate on the stimulus package. Because if you couple what was said by the Romers and what was said by the now budget director, the former director of the Congressional Budget Office, Peter Orsai, we know very well that there were concerns about the pursuit of this kind of policy, which they now uh, have embraced just by virtue of being in the administration, which I think is unfortunate. Of course, I'm happy to further yield to my friend. I don't want to prolong this, but going back to the food stamp issue, which you you limit, you cut in your in your budget. I mean, uh, almost every we rescind the increase. We rescind the increase. The increase that was in the stimulus almost package. Every economist that I have read 
has said that one of the most stimulative ways to get this economy going, and one of the most stimulative uh, spending is on food stamps. That, that I can, I, there's a lot of economists including, that agree Including, that, including yeah. John McCain's uh, uh, economists during the campaign. I would just simply say that, uh, that going back to the issue of food stamps, Mr. Dreyer, we're not per the safety net is not working right now. There are people falling through the cracks every day. And it is, you know, and I feel ashamed as the United States Congressman that well, we're not doing more. Let, let me reclaim more. my time and my say that. about your budget is that. Let me reclaim will, my will time. Those even more. Yeah, we May just, I reclaim my time, Madam Chair? Madam Chair, we'll, we'll, if I can we'll, reclaim we'll, my time. We'll yeah. We're going to do that. And l let me just reclaim my time and say that clearly we want to ensure that those who are truly in need are able to benefit. But to the point that has been raised, entitlement reform, entitlement reform, and doing it and utilizing our constitutional responsibility here rather than passing it off to somebody else to deal with it, we need to step up to the plate. And if we can deal with entitlement reform, we can make sure that those who are on food stamps and truly in need will not have the solution be simply expanding the food stamp program, but will instead be no against, the reform. No one's against the entitlement reform, Mr. Dreyer. Well, but the but fact is, we need to well, do it. It doesn't do anything. We, we need to do it. We need to do it, and we need to work in a bipartisan way to do it. But that is the most effective way to ensure that those who are in need of food stamp relief are able to get it, rather than simply putting an additional multi-billion dollar package uh, in that direction. So um, I know we've got lots of people from whom I we want to I would simply say, if no one's against entitlement yes, reform, yeah, then, let's then why do it. aren't we doing it? Let's just get it done. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And Mr. Spratt, Mr. Ryan, and all of our colleagues, so I genuinely appreciate uh, all of your input. Uh, Mr. Spratt, um, the last discussion that was going on had references to entitlement reform. Uh, would you respond? How does uh, uh, your budget uh, uh, contemplate uh, that concern? Could I respond to a couple of other things before coming? Please. Capital gains, dividend tax, the Bush administration in 2001, lowered the rate to 15% for capital gains and 15% for dividends, but provided that these rate cuts would expire on December the 31st, 2010. That's what the President assumes they will expire and they'll be renewed at a slightly higher level of 20 percent instead of 15 percent. But that increase per the President's budget request this year will not apply to people who make less than $250,000. The gentleman yield quickly on that point. That wasn't, that wasn't President uh, I, 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 I will yield. <laughs> Uh, I knew you would. I knew you would. That's why I spoke. Gentlemen, gentlemen. Let's well, it, it was it was not the vision. It was the it was in fact the, the rules in the other body that led us to that. Let point. me reclaim my time. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Spratt. I'll proceed accordingly. The gentleman from California, my good friend, and Mr. Ryan both have touted the uh, advantages of having minor levels of debt and talked about the debt this will accumulate. They seem to forget what happened in the Bush administration. We don't have to speculate about what's going to happen over the next five or ten years here. We know as a matter of record what happened in the Bush years. When Bush came to office, there was a national debt of $5.7 trillion. When he left, there was a national debt of $11 trillion, a $5 trillion increase in fact. Not, not argumentatively, that's a matter of record. As for jobs, there's barely any comparison. In the Bush administration, the excuse me, in the Clinton administration, the average job growth per month, new jobs per month, was 230,000 jobs a month. 230,000 times the years he was in office, the total job creation, net job creation, was 22 million, compared to about 5 million in the Bush administration years. So we've tried what they're advocating today, and the results are palpable. They're a matter of record. They simply are not as, as uh, desirable as what we've been able to what was accomplished during the Clinton years as compared to what was accomplished during the uh, George Bush's years. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. As for entitlement reform, the uh, budget has in it, Mr. Hastings, so-called reserve funds. And these reserve funds are deficit neutral. If you want to do health care reform, that will <coughs> cover some of the 46 million Americans, if not all, who don't have health insurance today, you can do it through the medium of one of these reserve funds, but number one, you have to define what you want to do, and number two, it has to be paid for, either by identifying a revenue source or by identifying 
offsetting cost cuts so that the matter is totally deficit neutral. That's true for the other uh, objectives too. One is energy and the other is, uh, is education. All of these are deficit neutral. With respect, to, with respect to Medicare, in order to help pay for, for health care reform, with respect to Medicare, the administration proposed, we're not proposing it here because we don't get into specific policies, but the administration proposed, for example, that Medicare Part C, which is Medicare Advantage, HMO Medicare Services, be amended or changed so that they would be competed more rigorously. It's their belief that this system, which should be saving money, but it's costing 14% more per beneficiary than pay for service, fee for service, traditional Medicare. If we amended it, made it more competitive, we could save $176 billion over a period of 10 years and use that to help pay for health care. Let me ask you, Mr. Spratt, um, the budget as proposed is a five-year budget? Yes, sir. And the Senate budget that is uh, uh, being actively uh, uh, pursued at this time uh, uh, from the majority is a five-year budget? Correct. Mr. Ryan, your budget is a 10-year ten ten budget. budget. Five and ten, yes. Mr. Ryan, and then we show a long-term as well. Does your your budget have a reserve? No, we don't do reserve funds. We put everything inside of our budget. And so, for reserve fund is a way of putting it outside the budget. We put it all inside the budget. Did you put the uh, uh, Afghan and Iraq war? Yes, we did. In your budget. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, will a supplemental be required based on the funding that you offer? In but that's up to the administration. That's not determined by our budgets. Uh, that's not our call. That's the administration's call. All right. But your substitute represents a, a 25 percent cut uh, from the uh, president's um, uh, 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 proposal request? I, no. I don't know where you get that number. The already appropriated level. No, that's not a 25 percent cut. Okay. Now then, my final question um, of you is, in, in your initial comments, you assert uh, that this budget, and I'm paraphrasing, will leave future generations worse off. Right. And you feel uh, very strongly that that's the case. Um, obviously, many of us um, um, uh, disagree. Uh, but you and I uh, were here from 2002 until mm -hmm. um, uh, the new uh, president assumed office, mm -hmm. and he's been in office now 72 or three days. Do you feel that what we did from 2002 to 2008 made generations better off, future generations? <clears throat> I think the fact that we didn't tackle entitlement reform was a mistake. So and we, and I don't want to keep repeating the same mistake. Okay, entitlement reform. So we, we didn't tackle these big spending items, and right. they're getting even worse. Look, put it but, this but, way. But then can you answer my question? Do so, so yeah, I'm saying we, did? we didn't do what we should have done. All right, so we didn't. And I'm not saying let's continue not. Better so off. we shouldn't say don't keep. We made a mistake, which is we didn't get our fiscal house in order. Let's not make that mistake worse. I let's understand. not keep repeating the mistake. I That's understand my you. I just want to make sure that we understand that the mistake allowed for us to come up with a $1.6 trillion deficit right. that this new president right. has inherited. You any bet. way you cut it, any way you look at sure. it, however we go forward. Right. So and I'm believing that a five-year budget, based on all of the things where we have had deficit reduction that has been meaningful, is a lot more uh, sensible than a 10-year budget. Look, none of us could have contemplated uh, uh, 2001. None of us could have con contemplated C Katrina. We don't know about, or uh, wouldn't have known uh, 10 years ago about the floods in North Dakota. And I could go on and on and on. So enough already. Somewhere along the line, we have to bite bullets. And you are correct, and Mr. Spratt is correct in that regard. Uh, but I'm satisfied uh, that what we did from 2002 to 2008 uh, shouldn't leave anybody that I know in the future generation. Well, we had a great economy during that children. entire time. We had. Uh, perhaps one of the longest peacetime expansions in this history of this country. I would also say the president does give us a 10-year budget. Just so you know, yeah. the president submitted a 10-year budget. But this the budget chairman, we're considering The chairman had been admonishing years. the last administration for its seven out of its eight years for not giving a 10-year budget. And I think he was right. Mm -hmm. So the first, uh, the Bush administration gave us a 10-year budget in their first year. Then they gave us five-year budgets after that. Yeah. And the chairman of the committee at the time admonished the Bush administration 
for hiding the numbers in the second five years. I appreciate your answer. To President Obama's credit, I appreciate gave us a 10-year budget. And I, I'm, I'm satisfied in that regard. Okay. But if we wanted to really do something, we'd be doing a two-year budget if we wanted to bite bullets. Uh, but what we do around here uh, is play hocus pocus. And your 10-year budget is more magical in that regard than I believe, Mr. Spratt. It's a one, two, Spratt. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yeah. and nine and 10-year budget. Mr. Spratt wishes to respond, Madam Chair. If Mr. Spratt. And I'm finished, Madam. Thank you. Before we finish this round of questioning, I simply want to make the point that Mr. Ryan drew a number of comparisons on a side-by-side -side analysis between his budget and our budget. I would contest the way he characterizes our budget, but in addition to that, he's making some assumptions about his budget, which I think are highly improbable. If you look on page 35 of the Path to American Prosperity, which is their budget resolution, you'll see that he is sending or would send reconciliation directives to energy and commerce of $666 billion to be achieved over a period of five years and $605 billion to ways and means to be achieved over five years. Given the fact that reconciliation only applies to mandatory spending, entitlement spending, you can only surmise that these cuts would have to come out of Medicare and Medicaid, and since they come over a five-year period of time... Those are 10-year numbers. Is it 10? I thought it was five. Those are 10-year numbers. Can I add something to that? At that time, we're going to be spending $36,823,875,000 out of our federal government. It's all relative. It's all perspective. We're simply saying on mandatory spending, instead of growing mandatory spending at 5.3% a year, let's grow it at 3.9%. So we're not talking about cutting anything. We're talking about not increasing the spending as fast as it is being increased under current law so we can get our debt and our borrowing under control. And Mr. Hastings, to your point, uh, the reason we're so worried about this budget is all this borrowing. This budget, the president's budget, proposes to borrow more under his presidency than all 43 prior presidencies combined. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, somebody's going to stop buying our bonds. We're already, we're already getting criticized by the Chinese on this. The Europeans are lecturing us about fiscal discipline. We are going to have a moment in this country. I hope it doesn't happen, but it sure seems like it will or somebody's going to stop buying our bonds. The Treasury Department's already buying bonds explicitly. What does that mean? That means Treasury is printing money to buy our bonds. It's the equivalent of a snake eating its own tail. What does that mean to our constituents? What that means to our constituents is it threatens the value of our currency of their dollars. So the 88-year-old woman who's sitting in your district living on a fixed income it wipes out her savings. The middle class who are out there saving for college, saving for retirement, trying to buy a new house, it wipes out the value of their savings. That's why we got to get this borrowing under control. If we begin to go down the road of monetizing our debt, if we don't start tempering the growth of spending here, which is all we're proposing to do, heaven help us. We will wipe out the middle class in this country, just like other countries have done that, if they borrow and borrow and borrow beyond it's their limits. Gone. <laughs> there Thanks, is Madam no Chair. middle class. Mm -hmm. Mr. Diaz Ballard. No, Madam Chair, it's not gone. Uh, there what? is a middle class in the United States, and it's, uh, it's the most successful economic experiment in history. And, and, uh, well, Chairman, you know, what are you referring to? The American middle class. The American middle class. All right, but you're saying right now that we are in our most successful period of creating middle class? What I've said is the American middle class still today is the most successful experiment in, in, in economics uh, in the history of mankind. It is simply disappearing. The, uh, the Points brought forth by Mr. Spratt and Mr. Ryan, obviously, are uh, appreciated and well taken. They're one of the most admired uh, members of our Congress, and I thank both of you uh, for, uh, first of all, for your devotion uh, to the nation and your public service and your hard work. Uh, this is a fundamental debate. It's a fundamental debate. And Mr. Ryan was talking about how um, uh, if, unless, unless we get on the correct path, and it's, 
be pain, it'll be, it would be painful. It will be painful to do so, difficult to do so, but much less difficult now than in the future. Uh, and uh, it's happened time and time again in history. Uh, we're great nations, uh, successful nations with wonderful economies, uh, uh, collapse. And I uh, believe that that's not going to happen in the United States. I think the United States is going to uh, survive as uh, an extraordinary economic superpower. But I think the difficult choices have to be made. And, and I think that at the core of those choices and those difficult decisions is entitlement reform. And I agree with Mr. Ryan that I, the Perhaps the greatest mistake in the last eight years was not confronting it. Uh, but um, what we're seeing now, and you know, Sir Ryan pointed out, uh, alluded to the, the comments being made around the world uh, about, about the, uh, the path uh, that the new administration in the United States is following. Uh, and uh, when we see the, the president of the European Union uh, for these, this six-month period, uh, describe the path the administration has embarked upon as one that's going to destroy the financial, the world financial system. You know that's uh, that's an extraordinary statement. Uh, but uh, you know uh, uh, the prime minister of the Czech Republic is a, a very respectable and respected figure, uh, and so uh, I think that that comment. Uh, is one that certainly should not be ignored. As, as the challenges that have begun, the questions that have begun with regard to replacement of the dollar uh, in the future, uh, as, as the, uh, the world currency, uh, the, the bedrock of the world's currencies. Uh, I have a, a question about government spending and the percentage of the GDP uh, that government spending uh, will comprise. I heard Mr. Ryan say that in the projections, in the Republicans' uh, plan, uh, after 10 years, uh, government spending will be 20%, 27, 20 27. 0.7 percent of GDP. And that that's consistent with the tradition of 19, 20 percent, which is what, what it has been. Uh, I did not hear <coughs> The, Mr. Spratt, uh, I, I, you may have said it, but I, I, I don't remember hearing the, the percentage of um, what, government, gov what government spending will comprise of GDP under your plan. Do you have that number? I can give you the correct number, but it's, uh, it's over 20.7 percent. No question about it. But much in, in, in the first five years, we do take the deficit from where it is today, three and eight, three and seven down to $586 billion, and that's 3.5 percent of GDP. Still a bit higher than I would like to see, but nevertheless, I think we're showing the world's markets we're doing the responsible thing. The defi yearly deficit, is, you say the yearly deficit would be? 586 in 2014. Okay, which would be, you, you talked about a yearly, yearly. Uh, uh, a percentage of yeah. GDP, GDP we, of we have deficit. A, we have a problem in the second five years. I readily acknowledge that. Right. But I think we can, we'll have a better vantage point to uh, address those five years when we get out of the recession and we have a better vision of what the second five-year period of time between uh, 15 and 19 is going to look like. Okay. I guess... I'm not, uh, I'm not being in denial about needing to do something. We've got an annual budget. That means every year we come back and address it, and with the deficit we've got looming over us, it has to be dealt with every year. It has to be confronted. All right. Uh, it, uh, the, the administration has, has submitted a 10-year plan, is that correct? Yeah, there's 24.5% of GDP in the last year of their budget. 24, you said? 0. 0.5. 24. Versus ours, which is 20.7. Right. So it's a, it's a significant, significant difference. And, and the, the, the reason that, that, that it's so important, really, is because when we do have to confront the moment uh, that, Mr. Sprite, you've alluded, you've alluded to it also. Uh, when painful decisions are made and, and, and 
a path is embarked upon to save the currency and to save this economy. Uh, we hopefully won't be at a point where it won't be possible. And that's, that's what hopefully we should try to avoid. Yeah, I would just simply say um, that's, a, that's a big number and it's an alarming number. And we're at 27.7 right now or 28.8, depending on whose numbers you use. Um, the question is where do we go? And we're putting us on a pathway to keep us back down to 20%, our historic average. The administration's budget, the chairman's budget, puts us on a pathway to go up and up and up. I've got three children. Uh, they're four, five, and seven years old. By the time my three children are my age, I'm 39, the government is projected to be at 40% of GDP. Which is a what, about what France that's, 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 that's the federal government I'm talking about. The federal, federal government will be at 40% of GDP just to keep this current government going. That's if we don't pass this budget. So let me say it a different way. It's our average size of government is about 20%. 20 cents on the dollar uh, from every dollar made in America goes to the federal government. By the time my kids are my age, just to pay the bills for the programs we're running right now, 40 cents out of every dollar. I asked the Congressional Budget Office, so did Senator Gregg, uh, the ranking member of the Senate Budget Committee, well, what would the income tax rates on our children have to be uh, in order to pay all this? And so they just gave us this. And I, and I don't know if you have our plan. We, we spell this out in here. What they tell us is by the time my kids are my age, to pay the tax bill for all of this government that we're on the trajectory to reach, the lowest income tax bracket that lower income taxpayers pay, which is right now the 10% bracket, would have to go up to 25%. The middle income tax bracket for all the middle income taxpayers would have to go up to 66%. And the top income tax bracket, which is the one that the small businesses pay, would go up to 92%. You would kill our economy if that ever occurred. Yeah. So our point is, let's, we have these problems. We need to own up to them, fix them, reform this government so that we can maintain the American legacy of leaving the next generation better off. We know these are the current projections of what we're doing to the next generation. We know this now already. And so to talk about the gentleman, the, the problem is we haven't fixed this. We, we have to fix this. And my problem is this budget makes it worse. It creates new entitlements, adds more entitlement spending on top of the ones that are already unsustainable. Yeah, it makes it more difficult to begin the process of, of guaranteeing for, the, for future generations the standard of living. That's right. That, has, that characterizes the economic superpower of the United States. That's right. It sends us in the, diff, in the wrong direction. That's, right. that's our point. Right. Mr. Spratt, you have a point? Well, bear fairly in mind. What the principal initiatives in the budget would do, the first goes to health. And I think everyone in this room would, would acknowledge mm -hmm. that this is the only developed industrial nation in the world that doesn't see to it that one way or another all its citizens have health care when they need it. That's something that's long overdue, something that needs to be done. Can we do it in an affordable fashion? That remains to be seen, but it's certainly part of the objective because the president said, I want to do it without spending any extra money. We're spending a fortune, 16, 17 percent of GDP on health care now. I'd like to move some of the pieces around and see if we can't benefit the people who don't have the advantage of coverage today. Surely that's a goal we can all stand for, and if we do achieve that, I think we improve the standard of living in this country, and particularly if we achieve it on a, on a deficit-neutral basis where we achieve some gains by, by some savings and other health care programs which we apply to covering people who don't have the benefit of coverage. Education, there's money, extra money here for education, critically important if we're going to be competitive in the world. Not as much as I would like, but still it is one of the initiatives the administration has. And alternative energies, I think we'll be better off if we have energy independence or something close to it. And that's the objective here, to develop energy forms of energy that we could do domestically and not have to be totally dependent on oil and gas from other parts of the world. So if we could accomplish these things, I think we make the country better. If we can accomplish them with cost offsetting, paid for without adding to the deficit, so much the better. Would the gentleman you? Of course. Mr. Spratt, I'm interested in, um, in what you said about uh, we're the only industrialized country in the world where all its citizens don't get health care when they need it. Maybe South Africa. 
is an exception. So you're saying that in our country, we have a, a health care system that is uh, deficient in terms of every other industrialized nation in the world. No, I didn't say that. I have two daughters, two sons-in-law, and two first cousins who are physicians, and I think they're the best in the world. And I think our health care, for those who can afford it, is the best in the world. But there are 46 million Americans who can't be assured that they'll be admitted. But would you, Mr. Spratt, would you like to say 46 million Americans? Do you want that to be your statement? Is it 46 million Americans who do not well, have Do you think some of these immigrants? Is it 46 million Americans who do not have insurance? That's a number that I understand is a correct number, but let's say it's less than that. It's still a substantial number. It runs into 20, 30, 40 million people. Are you saying they don't have health care or they don't have insurance? They don't have access, uh, assured access to the health care system. They, they may show up to the emergency room, and by virtue of law, they have to be treated if they show up there with an emergency So they room. have access to health care. Yeah, and they distort the system when they use it in the amount but of But they have access to health care. They don't have assured access. They cannot be assured that when they need it, it'll be there. But if they go to what, the emergency room... Would the generality yield? Yeah, 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 I can reclaim my okay. time, and then... If you right, thank you. Like, okay. uh, I mean, I'll yield to you. Uh, Will the gentleman yield? Just, just respond to a point that the well, uh, just a quick. Just, just give me a, a, Mr. Jasper, a, a, a point, and then I just made make a point, and then I'll yield to you. Um, you know, I, I uh, thank you, Mr. Spratt, for uh, you know uh, once again uh, uh, your uh, eloquence and uh, you know, you're, you're a, as I said before, extremely respected member of this of this house. Uh, <laughs> My, my main concern is that the decisions, and Mr. Ryan pointed this out, the decisions that we have to make at some point, and you alluded to them, at some point. I readily acknowledge. Yeah, we're going to have to make decisions to continue to get, to stay on a path towards the, the, the preserved solvency. And, and, I, and, and I think that it's, it's going to become a lot more difficult after this budget is passed. Uh, and so um, it's, it's, you know, it's a very serious problem the nation is facing. And, uh, and I think it's going to be a lot more difficult for uh, whenever this Congress, and it will, you know, when, when this Congress and, uh, and uh, an administration decide to, you know, put us on a path to save our economy, uh, it's going to be a lot more difficult. I'll yield my point. Just two quick points. Part of the problem with this discussion is that it's not, it's not always put in the full context of everything. On the issue of, uh, of, of investments in healthcare, in medical research, I mean, you know, my, my colleagues assume that there'll be no innovation. If we find a cure to Alzheimer's disease, imagine the savings to Medicaid alone, and something like that. Secondly, I'd say to the general lady, my friend Dr. Fox, um, you know, when we, we, meaning the Democrats, when we're talking about healthcare for all, it's not Simple. It is not defined by that you can show up to an emergency room, you know, and get treated. That's not health care. If you want to save money in the health care system, you have to emphasize prevention. You need a holistic system. So the gentleman from uh, the chairman is absolutely right uh, when he says that there are tens of millions, I don't say 45 million Americans. I don't know how many immigrants, uh, but 45 million Americans, you know, who have to rely on health care through an emergency room. That's not a health care system. That's, in, that's, that, that's, not, that's not cost effective. And that's not right. We can do much better in this country. Let me make my time, and I, I, I thank my uh, friend for uh, his participation again. Uh, and and we, we believe uh, in expanding uh, access uh, uh, through insurance coverage uh, to those who don't have it. But we want to preserve that system that you, Mr. Spratt, referred to. Those members of your family uh, are, are part of uh, a uh, un, un, unparalleled uh, uh, I would group of men and women, group of men and women who, 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 perform at, who, at, who provide health care in this country. Now, it, our, our, our debate is that we want to we want to make sure that we preserve the quality as we expand, but make it more efficient. Access to all. Now, efficiency obviously always has to be increased, 
But, but um, you know, we, we're cognizant of the fact that when people of, when people of means throughout the world uh, have a problem, where do they go? They come here. So we want to make sure that the quality is preserved while access to that quality is, is made, made available to all. Anyways, I thank you both, and I know there's, uh, there'll be further comments and questions, and I thank my colleagues. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Arkeer, before I call on you, would you yield to me for a moment? Please? Yes. Uh, this health care issue is very important to me. I spent a good part of my life worrying about that. And there, it's not true that people who have health insurance have access to health care. A lot of people are denied because it's not covered by their health insurance. A lot of people have something called a pre-existing condition and their insurance company won't go to cover it. Uh, but Mr. McGovern is exactly right. Now we are free to do medical research. And what we've already found with genetics is being able to restore eyesight in some persons. And what we can do with stem cells, we're going to cut down on invasive surgeries and hospital stays. And it's going to be a much better health care system for that. Where our intent is going to be to prevent conditions rather than to try to deal. But there are far too many people that I know about. Uh, we made mammograms available to an awful lot of women uh, who then found that they had breast cancer but had no access to treatment because they had no insurance. And if people believe that's not happening in this country, or they believe that people are not dying because they have not had the access to health care, they are very sadly mistaken. Mr. R. Curie? Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Uh, uh, let me let the chair know that uh, he voted for the present his amendment and that he would be back. Thank you. Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the gentleman. I mean, what is very obvious from this hearing so far is the amount of work, uh, hard work that you have put into your presentations and, and uh, your, your respective budget. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, as a ranking member. Um, Mr. Ryan, you indicated uh, early on, uh, I think in response to one of Mr. Dreyer's questions, and your budget would produce, I think the, the, the number was 2.1 yeah, million jobs. Yeah. Uh, over what time frame? Yeah, so how, how do we do that? What we did no, was... No, no, no. My, my question is over how long... Oh, in, in the year 2014. So we we have we ran a, um, so a regression period, analysis through the... Uh, period, it would create... No, in the fifth year, it would produce 2.1 million more jobs under our budget than the Obama budget. How many over the five-year period? I don't know off the top of my head. Each year, the way the numbers work is each year we're producing more jobs than the Obama budget. The Obama budget, because of its enormous amount of taxing and borrowing, actually decreases economic growth off the baseline. And so it goes into lower, lower jobs. Our bill, because it gets borrowing under control, spending under control, and keeps taxes lower and more tax incentives for economic expansion, creates more jobs. On average, um, going through the spreadsheet in my mind, our budget on average increases, uh, has more jobs in every single year than the Obama budget, between something like one to 2.5 million jobs. Including I just- Including the first year? You, you say your budget? Uh, no, not in the first year. Because uh, our, our reforms kick in a little later because we're, it's not 2009. So, so how many less jobs in the first year? You know, oh, I, we don't create less jobs. The, it starts working in 2010 and going on out. Well, well, obviously, so right now, if you look at the regression analysis, they're about the same. They're, they're about the same in 2010. And then, and then the numbers start moving fast in the out years. Meaning 2011, our, we have more jobs in the Obama budget, even more jobs in 2012, even more jobs in 2013, even more in 2014. I picked 2014 as just the midpoint. 2015, we it's 2.4 million more jobs in the Obama so you're budget. Saying in 2010, you more jobs than, than the no, I'm not saying that. I said in 2014, it's 2.1 million more jobs. In 2010, that's the date in which the model starts. So there is no difference. There's no difference in 2010. How about 2011? More jobs under our plan. Was this the Heritage Foundation? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, we're we're not making any bones about it. We took a a well-respected uh, economic model put both budgets into the model, and the model showed us that our bill creates more jobs than the Obama plan. Let's just do it another way. Let's take the Romer study. Well, well, wait, Mr. Chairman, do you agree with that? I have no idea. I don't know what the biases of that particular program may be. I would think since it comes from the Heritage Foundation, it would, uh, it would attribute great uh, growth potential to tax cuts, for example, maybe more than another program or another computer system was. I don't know. Yeah, he, he can. I mean, I, I wouldn't expect the chairman to be able to do it. and put it through the same system that's been tested over and over again 
and found to be reasonably policy neutral. Um, Mr. Ryan, another question earlier on, and I think uh, Mr. Hastings asked you um, with respect to your projection in your budget with respect to what the president has asked you on his budget. You talked about a 25 percent difference, and you said that that didn't exist with respect to the president's request for defense spending uh, and your. Yeah, we, we, we were five billion higher on the DOD number than the president's in the first year. We're at the chairman's mark, which is 540 million higher than the president's on veterans, um, and then uh, we go to what would have been a CR. Uh, meaning the omnibus was a 8.6% increase, I think, in spending. We take back that 8.6% increase and then freeze it on out. That's not a 25% cut. That's an 8.6% cut. How about with respect to the amount of money that the president spends on State Department uh, programs? Ah, 150. I don't know what 150 is off the top of my head, but I can tell you it's less. That's one thing I can tell you. Uh, we're, we're, we are less on 150. We are less in every category because we're freezing spending and the administration is not freezing spending, uh, except for defense and veterans. And including with respect to the State Department? Yeah, 150, that's, that's, the, that's the budget function the State Department is in. Yeah. The base budget for the State Department is $38.2 billion. The request was $15 billion on top of that, a big increase. And like a 45% increase they asked for. And we just didn't think a 45% increase in the State Department was They important. justified by saying every year, continually, every year, we have substantial supplementals and emergency appropriations because of things that happen in the world that we are not uh, unable to foresee and expect. So they have tried to actuarially determine how much money that is. Fifteen billion dollars approximates what they say they've been getting. They want to put it in their base budget. We gave them ten billion dollars of their request, nine point seven billion, and uh, we've held five point three. Before it's over with because they're so intent on having the uh, having the State Department adequately funded so that they can hire more foreign service officers and have a much more active foreign policy than we've had for the last 10 years, there'll probably be some concession of the uh, remaining money. I, I, the State Department. Excuse me. I, I, sorry, John. Um, I would simply say, you know, ultimately this is up to the Appropriations Committee. They decide these allocations. Yeah. But we've got to, you know, make assumptions. Uh, the administration, um, John's staff is telling me, or Chairman's staff is telling me, uh, asked for a 40 percent increase in the State Department. He didn't go that far. We obviously don't go near that far. Um, ultimately, it's up to the appropriators to decide, you know, within the priorities where they go. But we don't, we don't put an assumption of a 40 percent increase in there. No, we don't. If you have your way, we will spend less on State Department spending. One of the yeah, I would not. If I had my way, I would not increase the State Department's budget by 40 percent. That's right. Um, now, Mr. Chairman, uh, earlier today I had uh, uh, a couple of uh, Ubangiri farmers come to my office, and I have to tell you, it was one of the most. Uh, difficult stories to listen to in terms of the plight of the, of the, especially the small dairy farmers. And I have many of them in, in my district. And uh, Mr. Ryan, I think you probably... Yeah, what is class ones, like $9 or something like and, that? Uh, it's, they're, they're, they, they're really hurting badly. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you do in, in, in your budget with respect to agriculture? Well, <laughs> when I first came here, I had a good constituent who was a dairy farmer, big dairy farmer. And he had a big complaint about... Uh, 50 cents levy that was being put on every 100 rate of milk we sold in order to pay for public promotion of milk. And he wanted that repealed. And so I introduced a bill to repeal the uh, levy on milk and straight up on the milk program and everything else and went down to the Ag Committee and testified before the Dairy Subcommittee. First question out of the box was about uh, whether or not we had a, what, contract program we The compact you're talking about. Yeah. I had a clue. Then the next question was just out of the blue. I didn't know what he was talking about. That was 26 years ago, and I still don't understand it. <laughs> but, but we, the uh, farm program is, is, is appropriated uh, at the presence level without the uh, cuts. Above the presence level without the uh, cuts he requested. We left it intact. It did so for a reason, because we told the farm, the agriculture committee last year, this is what you've got to renegotiate your program. You can you can give more to this and less to that, but you've got to stay within these boundaries. It was not easy to do. It took months to get it done, but they finally got it done, and we didn't think it was fair to go back and reopen that can of worms and go back through those negotiations again. 
particularly for the amount of money the administration was talking about. We, we don't we don't make any changes in the farm programs in our budget as well. I'll I'll tell you we have a saying in Wisconsin. Yeah, that's that's in the other programs. Most of the agriculture budget is non-farm program, non-commodity programs. Uh, I mean non non-program payments. Uh, well, I mean, well, how much do you cut from agriculture? Uh, over ten years, thirty-eight point five billion out of its baseline, which does not come from um, um, the commodity programs. We have this saying in Wisconsin that uh, milk is thicker than blood, <laughs> and. Uh, we used to have these huge wars between New Yorkers and Wisconsinites, you know, and Vermont, Vermont people because we had these dairy compacts. We don't have dairy compacts now. We have sort of more of a federal national system. Unfortunately. Um, yeah, well, we were really happy you don't have the dairy compacts anymore. Um, but we don't, we don't propose, um, even though Mr. McGovern and I have, have opinions on this, we don't propose changing um, the farm bill because you're, you're already a year into it. But That's not a significant cut. It's thirty-eight billion dollars. No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, I don't. Let me. It's not a cut. It just doesn't grow as fast as what the president's proposing. Is this right. nutrition loans. Yeah, this is out of the nutrition programs. Yeah. Um, you give me a minute. Well, so I can get back to you. I, I'm trying to figure out what 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 that sorry. function is it's increasing. Out of the nutrition but program? we're um, well. It's up to the agriculture committee, but we don't give them instructions uh, on how to get their savings. Um, we've talked to our ranking member who does not want to get those savings out of the farm programs, but we don't direct those. I mean, as the chairman will say, we don't direct how they get those savings. We simply say to the committee, meet your target. Here's your number. They, they decide those policies. What but we don't assume that we're uh, unwriting the, rewriting the farm bill on this. What about with respect to student loans? Um, we don't assume. Well, I'll tell you this. We do, we do not do... Uh, the new mandatory program that the administration is proposing, which is turned on for five years and then is turned off, they actually eliminate it. Uh, we think if you're going to do a pilot project like that and not, not go on the mandatory side of the budget. Does your budget recommend less for student loans nope. than the president's proposal? Mm -hmm. Same amount? It doesn't recommend, it doesn't, it's silent on the issue. Silent on the issue. Mm -hmm. We follow the president's recommendations, including this is a matter of something we haven't discussed. His proposals for going to direct loans and saving over five, 10 year period of time, $53 billion, which we use to increase the uh, amount of Pell Grants from, I think it's 5320, 5350 today to 5550. So there would be an increase in the Pell Grant, but it would be paid for by restructuring of the loan program itself, saving over $50 billion. Disaster relief. Um, does uh, does your chairman, does your budget propose anything with respect to disaster relief? We put in 10 billion a year, just to acknowledge that it's only fair to, to appropriate something. How much actuarially should be could be debated by actuaries for a long time to come. We thought 10 billion was a reasonable number. Is that in the reserve account, or is that? No, it's is a that regular account for regular. Is it under fee? Under Reserve. It is reserve. It's reserve. No. It's a reserve. No. No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Rankin, put anything in? No, we don't do that. It's a, it's a regular line item yes, yes. program. Yeah. Um. I guess then my last point is just simply this: that I think that it seems to me that no wonder. I mean, I sit here and I listen to Mr. Ryan. You say that your budget doesn't cut in different places, and yet it does cut in different places. It gets, it so spends ask, less, yeah. And I ask you a specific question, you say, well, no, there's no real difference, and yet we made cuts. I'm very confused, so I yeah, sure. understand how the American people are. Let me explain how a budget resolution works. No, I, I understand. Okay. If I, if I All right. I understand how the budget resolution works. What I think the problem is, is that very often these budgets are not written in a truthful way, and I want to commend uh, Mr. Spratt for for, for, writing, for doing a budget, at least with respect to putting the, the, the money on the table that is there, with respect to defense spending, with respect to the programs that uh, used to be funded off the books but not put on the books. So uh, I just, in, in the way. Mr. Mr. Curry, that's, I just got to tell you, that's not fair. We, we have more detail in our budget than the chairman has in his budget. That's well, just not a fair well, uh, you're portrayal you're of our budget. Cutting, and then when I ask you if you're cutting in a particular area, you say, no, we're really not cutting. When we're increasing a program at a slower rate, I don't call that a cut. Maybe you do. But oh. you're, you're, you're not accurately portraying our budget 
because we put more level of specificity, more illustrations on how to save the money than the chairman does in his budget. Well, my, my problem is this, is that you talk about long-term creation of jobs, and assuming for sake of argument, I, I don't agree with your numbers, but assuming for sake of argument that your numbers are right, the problem is, what happens in the short term? What the difference I see between the two budgets is with respect to the budget proposed by, by the administration by Mr. Spratt, there is more of a safety net for the people who don't have jobs, for the people who are not able to get a job and work until we create these jobs. Right. And I see that as the big difference so, between the proposed budget by Mr. Spratt and, and the proposed budget. We have a difference on how best to achieve economic growth. We don't think borrowing and spending is the way to prosperity. We continue unemployment insurance. We don't have a job until that's one of the reasons why we extend unemployment that's, insurance that's in our budget. That's the big difference. That is the big difference. I have nothing further. Can I add something just in conclusion? Yes, sir. He may have more narrative, but he doesn't necessarily have more numbers. We're about the same when it comes to numbers. And well, we got five years more worth of numbers. <laughs> well. <laughs> but I still say that some of the numbers I would question there is for the reconciliation over 10 years, a trillion, $380 billion. That dwarfs anything we have ever contemplated for reconciliation in this institution. We're also spending over $40 trillion in that budget window. Well, trillion $380 billion is bound to mean changes of significance in numerous different places in the budget, particularly with uh, respect to mandatory programs. I need to clarify something for a moment. Mr. Ryan, your budget, if I understand what you're saying, says that you leave it up to the committees. You don't cut or expand anything. We, what we do, just, just what a budget resolution does, we give committees... We uh, give the uh, committee a number. Yeah. And, yep. just and then they decide how to achieve it. And we say, here's, here's how we justify giving the committee this number. These are the things that we think they could do, which would justify giving them this instruction. But it's entirely up to them on how they achieve these savings. That's how every budget resolution has Including ever been written. Including the fact that they may pay no attention to your number. That's, they normally don't. Uh, which the chairman gives, really let me just say it this way, number. the chairman, the well, chairman. You, well, excuse me, me, but how can you have a budget number if, if you no, put they it don't, off to somebody else? They pay attention to the number, they don't pay attention to the policy. It's the committees that decide the policies. Let me give you this. The chairman is giving a, a reconciliation instruction of a billion dollars to Ways and Means, a billion dollars to Ed and Labor, and a billion dollars to the Commerce Committee. Do you think that the Ways and Means Committee this year is only going to do one billion dollars worth of policy? or that the Energy and Commerce Committee is only going to do $1 billion of the policy. If you do the cap and trade bill that we looked at last year, that's $1.3 trillion. So I would argue you have more detail in our budget than you even have in the chairman's budget because he is simply saying, here's your authority, here's a, here's a, tr here's a billion dollars, give us a bill back. They could have a bill that has a $1.3 trillion energy tax increase in it and just have $1.29 trillion of spending on something in it and fulfill his mandate. We have more detail in our budget and direction than what even the chairman's offering. Well, it seems to me like you're handing out the mandate. You can have this much money, regardless of what the program requirements are in that committee. A budget or... is an architectural design of our nation's finances. Right. And we but are simply saying... numbers with it, That's it right. Not? And so we're saying here is the architecture of our budget. Here are the basic numbers and how it adds up. And then the committees with, of jurisdiction have to fill in the policy details to achieve these kinds of savings. And what we're proposing is we don't want to borrow nearly as much money as you're proposing. We don't want to tax as much as you're proposing. And we don't want to spend as much as you're proposing mm -hmm. because we want to get our fiscal house in order. It's a legitimate difference of opinion between our two parties. Mm -hmm. So our architecture, our budget, has lower numbers than yours does. Lower numbers on borrowing, lower numbers on taxing, lower numbers on deficits, Lower numbers on spending. Right, but your budget is suggestion, and our budget has numbers in it. It's where we want no, to go to cut the No, 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 that's, that's actually inaccurate. <laughs> Madam, the, Madam Chairman, that is inaccurate. Our budgets are, look, we could, you could probably, you take our budget. This is what a budget resolution looks like. They're about, you know, 50 pages. It's, a, it's all these pages full of numbers. His budget resolution is going to look the same thing. It will just have different numbers. It's three times bigger, right? <laughs> <laughs> I will. Mr. Ryan, um, I think the folks are trying to say that what you're doing in presenting a budget is different from what has always been done in presenting a budget and what is being presented by the Democrats. Would you please clarify that? My understanding is that 
what you're doing is exactly yeah. the same in process. Yeah, is I don't understand this. I don't understand this this issue. We're both presenting budget resolutions. And we're those both presenting. I, obviously, our numbers are different, but we're both presenting budget resolutions that are budget resolutions. And isn't that the way it always has yeah, been? Yeah, this is in compliance with the 1974 Budget Act. Right. So what you're doing is no different than what Mr. Spratt is doing. That's right. What you're saying is that within the budget, there are philosophical differences That's right. as to uh, what the numbers are and what policy should be used right. to get to those numbers. That's right. Yes, because thank you very much for clarifying that. Because um, both Mr. Arcuri, I think, who said he, I have it's time it's it's, it's it's the chairman's. It, and I'd be happy to yield to you. That's not at all what I was saying. I understand there are very clear philosophical differences. And, and my only point was to point out those very clear philosophical differences in terms of uh, you know, what best benefits on Americans who are unemployed. Sure, unemployed. that's fine. Look, we're going to have differences uh, agreement, how? And that, that's that's oh, what I was making. I, I have, I have no, uh, no other uh, point that I was trying to make. Well, let me then give time over to Mr. Are you finished, Ms.? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Let me uh, let me uh, turn this over to Mr. Sessions. Come to me. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, the gentleman, Mr. R. Curry, Curry just uh, talked about how he believed that the Democrat uh, Democratic uh, budget would help unemployment better, uh, Mr. Ryan. And so, uh, on page four of the budget, it says uh, the CEO expects the unemployment rate to rise substantially from the estimated 5.8 percent. 2008 to 8.8 in 2009 and 9% in 2010 and 7% in 2011. And then the unemployment rate is expected to average about 5.6% during the years 2012 and 2015. Uh, he seemed rather satisfied that that was a, a better number and one which he supported. A gentleman was saying that his unemployment figures, because that's really ultimately uh, was important to him. What were the Republican unemployment numbers? Yeah, no, that's, that's the CBO baseline. I think you're, they're, they're talking about. So that's that's not his numbers or my numbers. That's those are the numbers from the, the CBO baseline and the rescoring. They just redid their baseline, the rescore of the, of the uh, president's budget. So we use the same numbers, uh, which is those are the CBO's numbers. So, so my point is, if if these are the figures that we're being presented with today, Mr. Arcuri says those are great and he's willing to live by them. What, what are your numbers? No, we don't, we don't set unemployment numbers. Those are set by the CBO based on their projections. And those projections then tell us what revenues are going to be, what expenditures are going to be. And then we write our budgets off of that baseline. And so uh, one of the things we agreed with the majority on and we maintain in our budget is continuing unemployment insurance. Uh, we, we think that that should be continued for, for some of the reasons Mr. Akiri said. But no, the unemployment numbers aren't, Mr. Spratt and, and I don't set those. Those are written by the Congressional Budget Office and they're their projections. Certainly they have to do with the budget that's laid out. That's right. It, it impacts our revenues and our deficits and all of that. would be based upon this budget. I'm asking if you have unemployment numbers as a result of your budget, which is different. Well, no, we, we, we just stick with the CBO baseline. So we have, I mean, we have economic modeling that shows us that we're going to improve employment because of our budget relative to the chairman's mark, relative to the Obama budget. Well, I, I was just doing that with Mr. Arcuri. Uh, our, our budget shows that in any given year, throughout the course of the period, we're, we're adding an average of about one to two million more jobs uh, in, to the economy than the, than the president's budget. I, I don't know what that translates into which rate of unemployment that is. But the numbers we must budget our, base our budgets off of are the CBO's numbers, and that's the CBO's projection on unemployment. Well, with the gentleman, I, I would just, just like to clear the record, uh, I don't think any unemployment numbers are great, and I'm not real happy with them. I just want to make that clear. I didn't say that. I, I'm not really happy with the unemployment numbers uh, under, under any circumstance. So just so the record is clear. gentleman, continue. What would be your point, then, that I should take? There was no, uh, you can take whatever point you would like, sir. Well, My point was simply for the, uh, for the record, I didn't say I was happy with any unemployment record, for any unemployment Well, I, I would characterize it in the way that you said I could. I heard you in reference saying that the Democratic budget you felt like would be better with unemployment. One would better be dealing with people that, that were unemployed, better in, in, in helping people who are unemployed. 
So not finding a job but receiving benefits. You're is that, oh, that's a question. I, I, I mean, can, well, then, what is your question? Well, my question is, are, are we? You said people who are unemployed would be better off. No, I'm saying no. That's not what I said. I I'm said, asking. Well, the, my point is that if you are unemployed, and I think you you seem to be assuming that a person who is unemployed is unemployed because they want to be unemployed. I, I I'm assuming that they're un, they're unemployed because they have no choice that they would prefer to work. And if they would, if they want to work, and if they are unemployed, as the vast majority, is, if not all the Americans are, that are unemployed, then they need every safety net the government can give them so that they and their families can uh, have as, as good a transition until they start working again as possible. And that's part of what we should do as government, be part of that safety net. Well, that, that was what I was saying. It's not getting a job, but that the government benefits because they're unemployed would be better under the Democrat budget than under the Republican budget. I and since you gave me the liberty to characterize it, I don't know whether it works this or not, but I'm interested in jobs. And so Mr. Ryan has already said that to the tune of several million over the period of time, quicker, faster jobs, and I think that that's important. I note also that there, uh, with this bill, we're going to raise the debt limit to $13 trillion. Oh. It's going to go up no matter what. I mean, it's just. Well, if you look on page 121, it says, and I know this, you may not have seen this, but it's on page 121. Can you tell me what that does there, Mr. Ryan or Chairman? Best resolution calls for insert. Is that what this is? This is raising statutory limits. That's what I'm the saying. The debt You're raising the debt limit. The, the debt limit rises to 13 trillion. Yeah, this is the Gephardt rule. Yeah, this is the we, we tried to repeal the Gephardt rule in, in committee, um, but this uh, this is what we call the Gephardt rule. This raises I'm I should probably not defend your pill, but this raises the debt limit in the budget resolution, which is uh, in adherence to the Gephardt rule. Right, so that's, I, I'm that's trying to doing. I'm reading this and asking if that's what that is. You're saying yes, in fact, that's what this does. Yeah. Um, I am worried about a point at which we seem to see differences between the two budgets on spending and jobs that you can show the deltas. Um, and I've heard you say, Mr. Ryan, that this is going to increase, you know, a double the amount of debt that we have and, triple. and then triple it. At, at what point does someone become concerned about not just loss of jobs, but inability to pay, inability to pay, and then insolvency, as we've seen from some countries <coughs> yeah. around the world. Does, does, does couple, that, it's does a that, really good question. A couple advice? points I would just quickly say, because I know people have, have time constraints here. Um, Medicare is going insolvent right now in 2019. The actuaries are telling us they're probably going to up that date to 2016. Social Security goes insolvent, meaning it runs permanent cash deficits in 2017. Next year, according to CBO, we're getting early numbers, that the, the, the surplus in Social Security will go down to $3 billion. Um, so are these two big and very important entitlement programs are very close to insolvency. That's issue number one. Issue number two is our bond markets. We had a bad day last Wednesday in the bond markets. Um, our, our, our bonds uh, had some pricing problems. At least we sold our bonds because in the same day, England missed a sale. They couldn't sell all of their bonds. Germany's missed two of them already, finding bonds. So right now, the Treasury bond is sort of the safe haven in the credit system right now. People, it's a flight to quality and safety, and people are buying Treasury bonds, and the yield's pretty good from the taxpayer perspective. Uh, it's about 3%. There's going to come a moment, and we believe it's going to come sooner rather than later, where the yield's going to go way up because we're going to have to pay more people to buy our bonds because our credit is questionable because we're not getting our fiscal house in order, because we're not dealing with our debt. We're doubling and tripling our debt, not getting it under control, sending it out of control. And our big concern is, number one, those borrowing costs go through the roof, and so interest on the debt is just enormously expensive. Number two, if somebody's not going to buy our bonds, then inevitably what will probably occur is the Federal Reserve will print money to buy those bonds and debase our currency, wiping out the savings of the middle class, wiping out the savings of seniors living on fixed incomes. 
wiping out the savings of people saving for college and things like that. And so we have a weird moment in our history here where our monetary policy and our fiscal policy are sort of conjoining and in, in they're in confluence with one another. And all the more reason why we got to get our fiscal house in order. We've got to get our borrowing down, or at least on a trajectory to go down, so we don't mess up our monetary policy and mess up our currency and wipe out the middle class. That's why I'm saying there's a new sense of urgency here that is brought about by this fiscal crisis and is being exacerbated by this budget, which is proposing more borrowing under this presidency than the presidents of George Washington to George Bush combined. I'm uh, worried about, which is different than I know the majority of members here are, that money that is spent have some return or can become an investment, like what we would know a capital gain. A capital gain a couple of years ago we talked about that would cost the government $9 billion, but return $550 billion of revenue. That's a good ROI, return on investment. Right. Are there parts of this bill which are ROI, which we will see in, in the uh, in, in the which, 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 uh, Ours are, well, either, really, either one. Well, there's a big debate about that, and I don't, uh, it's called the multiplier effect. <coughs> um, the Romer model, the Romer study, shows that what we call exogenous tax cuts, tax cuts that are good for economic growth, tax reform, structural changes, had the highest multiplier effect, the most bang for your buck, the most ROI. Uh, that ranges from 2.3 to 3. Um, that's what we put in our bill. Um, the most recent study on the neo-Keynesian model is what they call it, uh, on this kind of stimulus <coughs> spending, is that the return on equity is something, I think, uh, I think they're saying it's about 0.7. Uh, the administration's claiming 1.4. Um, so you can have a good debate about multiplier effects. We have our opinions, the chairman has his, and you know, well, we, we are have a difference of opinion on it. We also are arguing that investments in education, investments in health care have a very high ROI run over the life of the beneficiary. ROI. ROI. Not, not just investments, but a return, return on investment. Yeah. Would the gentleman... I would yield to the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what... You, you talked about a return on investment for education. How have we measured the return on investment in education in this country now? I believe we spend as much or more as any country in the world on education. How have you measured that in the past? And why is it that our children do so poorly on international tests? If we, what, you know, what's, what's the measure uh, a return on investment that you've looked at before and the difference between what we're doing now and what you propose to do, how is that going to be multiplied? It's largely determined by the capability of the student who has the benefit of the additional education. That's measured in earnings. But I understand, but how have you uh, objectively measured it? You're telling us now that you can objectively measure it because we're going to get a return on investment. Well, the most objective gonna... measurement is whether or not that person is making more money than someone in the same age cohort who did not have the benefit of an education. Okay, so tell me how you do that now in terms of the spending. We're spending X dollars now. You project spending more. What is that return on investment for the additional money that you We project spending, spending more for Pell Grants in particular. But no, what is the return on investment? I mean, I know... If I put my money in a bank account, I'm going to get X interest off of it. What is the objective amount that we're going to gain from the additional money you're spending on education? I can't answer you with an objective, but I can tell you something. We grew up in the same generation, same part of the country. And the GI Bill was known to everybody as an investment in human beings that had enormous returns on our society. But for people in our communities, subjective, yes, but also it was clearly a huge success story. But then you can't, can't, how can you use the term ROI if you can't give me an objective response? When the government, when I put money in a bank account, the bank guarantees me some return on investment. When you put this money into education, 
how do you know, how can you say to the American people by putting in whatever additional percentage, we are going to get this? How can you say that when we've done so poorly in the past? Additional formal studies, there are abundant evidence all around us. Well, just give me one example. Give me one Give me one numerical example, not an anecdote, of how spending has produced a result in education. I don't carry that around with me, but I'm sure it's obtainable. Well, I will they tell. Won't. I will tell you. I am. I have been in education, and I will tell you there is a reverse response. I've done lots of research I mean, people in like education. Lose. When. Productivity the poorest counties, the poorest counties in North Carolina, have the best <laughs> results on test scores. Not the counties that spend the most money. I, I yield back to my colleague. I reclaim my time. I, I appreciate the gentleman. I, I think that what I was trying to say is, I, I was asking Mr. Ryan about ROI, and the example was nine of uh, capital gains, nine billion dollars that would have been lost revenue to the government turned into $551 billion that came back in. And I was asking him about ROI or multipliers, as the gentleman referred to them. I was asking you, please tell me about the multipliers or the return on investment. And that's why the gentlewoman was saying, how do we quantify that? You said, yes, there are. And we were just trying to say, can you give us one example? So, I want to... I'm not trying to cut you off. I didn't know whether. No, that's okay. I could give you all kinds of examples. They get pretty personal. Loved one. Start with my own family, my own wife. So, I mean, I don't even understand this. It's so beyond me that we would even contest the value of an education. The United States is built upon the assumption that an education is an enormous boost for upward mobility as well as for productivity and uh, higher earnings and a more meaningful life. I, it just uh, astounds me that y'all don't concede that argument. You know that Mrs. Fox would say that Dr. Fox would say that uh, uh, that uh, is actually a reverse effect from education. People lose productivity, lose earning capacity because they got an education. Surely, sir. Thank you. What I'm trying to say is, is that when you have when you refer to the ROI, it is a definable economic uh, benefit. And we were simply trying to say, the money that you spend, are there multipliers in your budget that you could have to me? And I know, well, people will be better off, and people will be helped, and that's great. We were simply looking for something which would show the spending gave a better return so that we could go spend more. I mean, the Republicans looked at if we got something for capital gains for the $551 billion that came in, that was at about 20%. So 80% more went to building infrastructure. And those are quantifiable numbers. That's all we're trying to say. So, I, I, I think that your your point would be well made. I agree with it. Education is great for people. Probably not as easy a definable ROI, even though we see people's lives get better, and that I agree with. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you, and Paul Ryan, thank you for being here today. I just have one additional comment, as is consistent behavior with me, Chairman. Uh, from my years of serving on the Budget Committee with you, I would like to uh, thank you for having Tom Kahn, who is your staff director, make himself available to members. Uh, he's thought worthy, uh, he's consistent, he gives uh, uh, good answers, and I want to thank you for allowing the gentleman to continue with you. Uh, I, I, I like Tom Kahn, and, and I think he's done a great job. I mean, we like Tom Kahn also. <laughs> I'm a Tom Kahn fan. Uh, but, but my point is, is that I believe it's not just to this member. He's open to other members, and I appreciate and respect that. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I think it's helped our friendship greatly, and I, I appreciate the gentleman. Mr. Cardoz, you wish to reclaim your turn? Thank you, Mr. I apologize for having done. Missing uh, while this hearing was down before the meeting, and uh, uh, this is one of the most important debates that we have every year. And, and frankly, uh, it's one that oftentimes 
um, is subjected to mischaracterization and rhetoric, but I think it's also one that is very important. These two gentlemen have come before us today. I have tremendous respect for both of them. And uh, I think that it's an important discussion we have, and that's why I'd like to thank you. Um, there is no doubt that we have left a step that we have in our country for a number of reasons to have control. And the time limits need reform, and we need to get busy doing that. Uh, we need to try and bring the budget under control. What I will tell you is, being the representative of one of the hardest hit areas in the country, that we are in a place now where we have to take some unorthodox um, and, and costly remediations for some policies that got us in the table. I think that's something else all of us can agree to. That there is some very bad things going on in the country right now. High unemployment, high foreclosure, uh, things that are uh, the economy contracting and business or something. Uh, we have to right the ship. And that is unfortunately going to take some dollars to do that. And I think that this budget that's being presented uh, reflects that. Um, and uh, I, as many members here know, I'm a member of the Gulf Coalition. And we sat down with Mr. Spratt, we sat down with the President, and we made a number of requests to change significant portions of the budget. And in fact, about, I would say 97% of the requests we made were agreed to. Now, we didn't make every request to come into our head or to improve the situation. But we made a number of practical requests that we thought would help the process. And I want to thank Mr. Spratt and thank the White House for agreeing to those uh, and making those alterations. Um, and I don't know the custom practice about this, Madam Chair, but this, I don't mean this to be a rhetorical piece, but rather than me mentioning all the things that the Republicans did, I'd like to put a press release that we put out today. You want to insert that in the record? Without objection? I would just say that. Um, I Thank think you, Ann. What we got to do, and I've said this many times in this committee and other places, but is the number one thing we need to do in this country is put big in the world. And like we need to fight a fight with foreigner in the economy, we need to find a floor uh, in our spending and try to figure out how to look back. Like some of that is going to have to be a taxes, some of that's going to have to deal with spending, some of that's going to have to deal with growing the economy in a smart way that um, boosts our productivity and allows us to get more of the amount we spend. And I'd like to see this committee and all the committees in Congress take that thoughtful approach to the meetings out of this poll. Uh, I am supporting uh, the budget this year, and I'm also not stopping the other measures that we need to do to try and get the uh, fiscal situation uh, that this country finds itself in right in. Fred, thank you for your hard work. Thank you, sir. And I'll uh, be forward to try and fix the economy. Thank you. Yield back. I yield back. Dr. Fox. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Spratt, I, I have great admiration for you, and I, I think you and I probably did uh, both come up under difficult situations and uh, and education has made a difference, in, certainly in my life and in the lives of a lot of other people. And I never discount that. Uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate for the opportunities that I've had in this country, as all of us are. And so I don't want you to think that I don't believe that education is important in this country. But um, as my colleague said, I'm, I'm very, very concerned about getting um, the term investment uh, clarified where it should be. But I want to read you a quote, and I want, I want to uh, ask you a little bit about it. Keynes believed in deficit financing when the economy was stuck in a liquidity trap and could not get loose. But he did not believe in the kind of deficit financing that we're running today. I think he'd be appalled both by the current account deficit which we are running $618 billion, more than most economists thought was sustainable. It exceeds 5% of the GDP, and certainly I do not think he would find it all pleasing to his understanding of economics. A budget deficit expected this year to be $427 billion. 
Not even Maynard Keynes would look approvingly on that. And surely one of the things we should be about now is the adoption of a resolution which will take us back to where we were in the year 2000, back to surpluses because we need to be saving, not spending, as the baby boomers begin to retire. Do you have any idea who said that? No, who said that? You did. About Keynes? You said all three of those paragraphs on March 16, 2005, um, at when we were debating the concurrent resolution or, or you, uh, on the budget in the House of Representatives. Those are your words. I thought they were very eloquent. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'm wondering is, uh, you know, can, have you been to Damascus lately? To the ha, have you been to Damascus lately? No. Or on the road to Damascus? Oh, oh, Damascus. I thought you said the master to the government. Oh, no, no. <laughs> well, it's on people's minds. I know the master is on people. No, I mean on the road to Damascus. Tell me, what is it uh, that has changed in your thinking since you spoke those words just about four years ago? Well, I, I'm not convinced that Keynes wouldn't have recommended very substantial aggregate demand boost to get us out of the rut we're in right now. But I would readily recognize that he believed in more than he put in the general theory about aggregate demand. He wrote, a, he wrote an important op-ed piece in the London Times in the early 1940s called How to Pay for the War. Basically, this was about soaking up excess demand as opposed to pumping more excess, more demand into the economy. It was about soaking it up with uh, various devices, various policies. Well, well, let me focus, though, on your comment. And surely one of the things we should be about now is the adoption of a resolution which will take us back to where we were in the year 2000, back to surpluses because we need to be saving not spending as the baby boomers begin to retire. Let's, what has changed in your thinking? Let me share with you a story then. I was invited to go for a group to Austin, Texas to have lunch with Mr. Bush, mainly to talk about defense issues before he was inaugurated. And while there, we got in a conversation about the budget because I told him when everybody else had made this presentation, Mr. Bush, if you do, the, if you do what you're talking about in the way of tax cuts, you're not going to have room to do what you're talking about in the way of defense. They're not mutually exclusive, but one affects the other. And what I proposed to him and to Carl Rove on the way back was that they consider taking up something that had a corny name, but a deep substantive truth to it called the uh, black box, <coughs> that the surplus being run then in Social Security be used to buy up outstanding debt, thereby reducing Treasury debt so that by 2020, when the baby boomers began in earnest to present their claims for Social Security and Medicare, the Treasury would be more solvent than ever to meet those claims. That's a good... Pro but, but then uh, why have you there not were no proposed that? in the Bush administration. I wrote them a memo and asked okay. Mr. Rowe to reply. Nobody, nobody indicated any interest in taking us up on that particular point. But the president had a huge advantage. And I said in a radio address right after he spoke in January, Mr. President, you may think you're sitting on an island of surfaces, but you're surrounded by a sea of red ink. You need to be dealing with the long-term liabilities of the country, at least with part And of what it. were the relative differences then and now, Mr. Spratt? We are faced now with a, with, with a huge deficit, a large part of which was the making of the mistakes of the Bush administration. Failure to take the path that there was open to them in 2001, which could have reduced our debt substantially, and said they said we could have it all, guns, butter, tax cut too, and never mind the deficits. At Mr. Spratt, how long are you and your colleagues going to blame every problem that we have on President Bush? Well, this particular problem he should own up to. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. Since Kansas time, since at least... Leon Kaiserlin's time in uh, writing the Full Employment Act of 1946, it's been the responsibility of the president and the government to keep the economy moving towards full employment. But let me, let me ask you this. 
Which branch of the federal government controls the spending in our country? Is it the executive, the legislative, or the judicial? It's a, the, to the legislative and the executive, of course. Well, how does the executive control the spending? First, he sends us a budget. Basically, we mark, we mark that budget as margins. Ever since 1921, the president's budget has been the main document, which is the becomes the budget of the United States. Well, the president proposes a budget. And we just, however, and and that's right. I remember very well when the Democrats. Would you ready to yield? Not yet. I remember very well when the uh, president's budget came over in 2007, soon after the Democrats took over. I believe the headlines were. Democrats say president's budget dead on arrival. I believe that's what was said by you and others. So obviously you didn't pay much attention to President Bush's budget when the Democrats took back over. Am I not correct in saying that the Democrats have been in charge of Congress since January 2007? That's correct. So the last two years of the Bush administration who was, in, who was in control of spending in the, con in the United States? Both institutions were. You make your point. Okay. So it, Bush had, ha, had no real control over the budget, except he oh, could... Wait. Listen, I've got one vote on the House floor today. On the, the budget. Cast, when the president cast his vote, right. it's equal to 290 votes in the House of Representatives. But... He has enormous power over the uh, course but, of the But as Mr. Ryan pointed out, the budget sets the parameters, but it's actually in the appropriations process that the money gets spent. Is that not accurate? Yeah, but the president, again, has to sign the appropriations bill. With, with, with Ex no money shall be drawn by, from a treasury except In by just one minute, Mr. McGovern. And, and isn't it true that last year the Democrats kept nine appropriations bills from being adopted, even though you had a huge majority, you could have passed any appropriations bill you wanted, and you could have sent it to the president. But you didn't do that because you were afraid President Bush would veto those because of the economic situation. Is that not accurate? Partly, and consequently, we had a, a, uh, an appropriation CR continuing resolution, which ended up being an omnibus appropriations bill which spent $19 billion more than the uh, bills that would have been, than the, the would have been provided had that uh, not. So the 110th Congress passed a continuing resolution, and then in this Congress, we spent 19% more, you said. $19 billion more. $19 billion more, 8.3% or something like that, more than what had been spent in the last year, correct? That's correct. And President Obama signed that, those appropriations bills. He did indeed. So Bush had nothing to do with digging this hole deeper that we are in right now. Is that correct? It no, was the Democrat correct. Congress and the Democrat President dug this hole a little deeper that you inherited from Mr. Bush. Will the general lady yield, please? Yes. I, and I, I say this with respect. Um, this is getting sounding more like a political debate on the House floor. And, you know, uh, and, House and floor. we've been we here for, get for two hours. And, and it would be helpful, I think, if, if we could find our questions to the, to the budget resolution at hand, because yeah. the, rewriting history at this particular point, I mean, in, in fairness, they've been here for two hours, and, and the general lady has asked many questions even before her time. And I uh, appreciate uh, her eagerness, but. Uh, I've, I've been paying close attention to how much time every member has been spending, and I, I, I believe that I am way under time in terms of the other members. But I will wrap it up. Thank you. Ms. I will wrap it up, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I do appreciate and respect what you're saying, but, but I think it's important to know that the opening sentence is, President Bush has dealt President Obama a hard hand to play. An economic crisis and budget and deficit. And so all you have to do is read the first page and know that the document is trying to make a point that she was trying to clarify before she went to page two. I yield back. Thank you. I, I would like to ask you one other question 
in terms, again, of the, the balance of power that has existed in Washington. Please tell me who was in charge of Congress under President Clinton in 1993 and 94, what party was in control of Congress? The Republican Party was. Uh, in 1993 and 1994, Mr. Chairman, okay. it was the Democrats. Yeah, excuse me, I'm sorry. From 94 to, through 2000, to 2000, 95 to 2000, what party was in control? Well, you know what party, you know the answer. Well, it was the, it was the Republicans. And under that time is when I believe Mr. Clinton gets all this benefit for the economy being so great, for jobs growing and things happening. So we have real selective situation here where we allow, we give the president blame when he's a Republican, even though he has no control over the budget. Well, the president's and first budget was passed with one Democratic vote and it was almost defeated. We got no Republican help at all in passing that particular budget. And that budget did lay the basis for what happened in the 1990s. Then the BBA of the Budget Balance Budget Agreement of 1997 was a truly bipartisan this is not what this is. accomplishment. Well, I, I just want to make sure we're clear on who is responsible well, for the spending in Washington. We need to make a distinction. Right. I'm almost in that case, sorry. Uh, to I, Mr. Mr. Ryan, I want to ask you if you would one more time go back over the issue of deficits and give a little historical background because I think those got a little clouded up. Mr. Ryan, yeah, yeah. If you would say again the historical trend of deficits, the current situation, and where we're looking to in terms of. Uh, I'm sorry, not the deficits, but the amount of the GDP. Uh, oh, of, of, uh, of government, government size. Yeah, I was going to say, I can go yeah, through the I'm deficit. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, the historical GDP average uh, for government expenditures is 20% on average. Right, and that's been under it's Democrats. A, that's the 40 year average. 40 year average. Yeah. Okay. And we are where now? We're at 28.5 right now. 28.5. I think that's where we are. Yeah, and, CBO says. And you're. You're saying it's well, good. So obviously it goes down from there, and part of this is because of TARP and stimulus and all these other things. Uh, the economy's down, so it's all relative. It goes down, and then under the uh, president's budget, it goes back up um, to 24.5 in the end of their budget. Under our budget, we bring it down and keep it down to 20.7. And under the, under the president's budget, it becomes what? Well, the president's budget gets us on this glide path where it goes up and up and up. So by the time my kids are my age, it's 40% of GDP. And the, the, the reason, that we, the point of that is, is because they're not, not only not tackling the entitlement problem, they're adding to it. And could you compare that to other countries? Do you have any idea um, what that's like in other countries? Yes. Uh, I know that's un unfair. Yeah, it, it's, it, that's the federal, so you have to add state and local. Um, that surpasses European size levels. What we find, there are a lot of studies out there, I don't want to be, take a long time here. A lot of studies say that when uh, governments, federal governments get over about 20% of GDP, they start to stagnate. There's a lot of data that shows if our government gets too big, um, and unemployment grows. Europe in the 80s and the 90s had unemployment rates that were in the double digits, usually double what ours were. Lower standards of living, lower per capita GDP growth. So what the CBO is telling us is that if we go on this pathway, that the per capita GDP, which is the measurement of standard of living, goes down under this project, projection and under our model, under our budget, per capita GDP, meaning standards of living, continues to go up and up for this and the next generation. And that's what, at the end of the day, we're saying it's all about. So basically, we know from history that lower government spending raises the standard of living Higher government spending lowers the yes, standard Yes, in of fairness living. to these models, there, there is a point where if it's too low, it harms standard of living. If you're a banana republic and you're at 4% of GDP and you're not providing basic services, then that's bad as well. So there's a sweet spot you've got to get. And uh, basic services and things like this, and, and we've been in that area. Most economists would have been, we're probably going over it. That's Thank a problem. You. Did you Thank want you. it? I appreciate that. Thank you.
I, um, I know we have three remaining um, uh, questions here. I, I would ask that uh, we not rewrite history and that we stick to the topic. And if you could be brief, it would be appreciated by those who are here. Mr. Perlmutter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just like to make a couple of points. Mr. Pratt, I appreciate the budget on health, education, and energy budget. But I think there's a fourth piece of this budget that really stands out, and that's the budget piece regarding our veterans. You know, I just want to compliment you on and on the budgets in the past two years as well as this budget in terms of fulfilling promises that we make to the men and women who serve our nation. So that's number one. The second, and just in response to my good friends from Texas and North Carolina, um, I want to uh, refer your attention to a study that was done for uh, Mr. Jim Saxton, and it, in that study, uh, it talks about how much, uh, in real dollars, you know, return on investment education has to the budget, to economic growth. And it says, uh, uh, other research confirmed this finding. Edward Dennison undertook one of the most comprehensive studies on the effect of education on growth. And his, he said, for increased education, it's 16, it adds a 16% to the growth in uh, in the economy, and a RAND study is 21%. And it says to illustrate the magnitude, it goes into all sorts of details. That's just the fiscal, that's the, that's the financial piece. And then, of course, it talks about education benefiting society in ways that cannot be measured by economic growth. Education enables Americans to be better mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, voters, and citizens. We know all of that. And one of the points you were making, Mr. Chairman, was the fact that the GI Bill was the greatest investment ever made in America, greater than the Louisiana Purchase and every other darn thing we've ever done. And so the fact that we're putting a lot of money into education is what's going to get us out of this ditch, this economic ditch that I believe was created by bad policies of the Republican administration over the past eight years. And with that, Thank you. I will yield to the balance of my time to Mr. Cardoza and then He's your problem. Would the gentleman yield? No, I'm yielding to Mr. Carlos, and I gotta be right back. Thank you, uh, the, the gentleman for yielding. And what I wanted to do was clarify the gentlelady's comment on timelines and budget history and how we got in this place. Uh, I believe that there was, in fact, a compromise and agreement that came on a bipartisan basis with Mr. Clinton and Mr. Gingrich and the Republicans in both houses to do PAYGO and statutory PAYGO. And in fact, that agreement, plus an economy that went in the right direction, uh, helped us get to surplus in this country. And in the year 2000, we forgot about PAYGO, and we started going the other direction. And frankly, if we kept those PAYGO rules, we would have been in a better place today, in my opinion. And one of the most important things that we got when we were negotiating on this budget document was a return to both PAYGO and statutory PAYGO, at least within the context of what we're asking for. And I don't, it, you can't, because this bill is not signed by the president, this is a resolution, you don't actually get to make it law of the land. But there is a number of us who have every intent in making statutory PAYGO the law of the land once again. And hopefully that is what will get us by working together on a bipartisan basis to get statutory PAYGO done will in fact get us to uh, a place where we've righted the ship of state once again. Now that's what I was thanking Mr. Spratt for. And I think that that part is what was left out of the gentlelady's uh, summation of history when she was talking about it. Gentlemen, yield. I don't have the time I was yielded to, but you uh, All right. whatever the I'm happy to yield to the gentleman. Uh, I, I, so that we're not having revisionist history, it's my belief and understanding that the parts of the tax code which created more of a deficit are the ones that would be marriage penalty and reducing taxes on the lower working Americans. The taxes which I believe are so vehemently attacked and disliked by my friends that are Democrats are the ones that return the greatest 
amount of revenue. So, and so my point would be these these tax cuts that did not lead us or that led to the deficits were the ones that helped the faster majority of people that you would be for today. I will. I appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to see the gentleman's documents. I've not. I, I've never seen anything that indicates what you said. I last year, uh, Congressman Matheson, or two years ago, I can't remember. Mr. Ryan had it, and I had a long discussion about this at prior rules committee meeting. Uh, I request from the CRS, which, which then said that the, the tax cuts that we're referring to did not pay for themselves. They did not. And but the capital gains would. No, no. Those were the ones the Bush tax cuts, is what I asked CRS. Next it was about 20, either 17 or 27. I've forgotten. I've seen the document, but I've forgotten. I'd love to change the document. Mr. Chairman, this has been a good document. No, it, it I is. Yeah. Give the no. More and, and I think it. Please let me and know. I, right, and, and I think I it. Back. I think it highlights the differences here. I mean, well, you're I'm saying that tax cuts, you tax cuts for the wealthy, or you like better than tax cuts for those in the middle. We and we like tax cuts for those in the middle more than we do for well, you know. So that's, anyway, that's okay. Not what we said. Right. We said what returned the greatest right. amount of money. All right, Ms. Pigree. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I can be brief, and since I'm a freshman, I don't feel the need to clarify or rewrite history. In, but I do want to just um, thank both Mr. Ryan and Mr. Spratt for their patient um, uh, clarification of issues today and their diligence in answering the questions. Mr. Ryan, um, I know there's been a lot of stuff around this, so I, I, I'm not intending to vote for your version of the <laughs> um, But I do thank you for being here in front of our committee. And Mr. Spratt, I just want to say in a couple of sentences, I appreciate the very hard work you've done on this budget. Um, for me, uh, representing the system in the state of Maine, I feel that your budget addresses many of the issues that people have been speaking to me about, and I am particularly um, pleased that we are making what I see as a serious investment in education, renewable energy. I come from the stage that uh, many of you may not know, but it's the most oil dependent state in the country, about 80% of our dependents, which in Mexico is about 60%. So we have a lot of new power. So we're very interested in renewable energy. Health care is my constituent's number one. A cost issue with small businesses or individuals who are going without it struggling with their insurance policies. I'm very excited about the real investment and the honesty in the budget around the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I'm very pleased about that. The middle class tax cuts are a wonderful job. I'm looking forward to a lively debate on this and all the other presentations. I really want to thank you both for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Polis. Thank you. Uh, it's also my first time going through this process and uh, coming out of the private sector and also uh, my experience in the public sector is generally around school districts, school district budgeting. Uh, one of the uh, matters that, that are, both of these budgets are done, both um, Mr. Ryan's uh, as well as Mr. Spratt's that make it very difficult to, for me to discern much out of it is they don't have a separate capital and operating account budget. Um, a budget would be much more helpful in my opinion and useful and truthful if it had a if it had a capital budget uh, as well as an operating budget, so um, it's been going on for years and years. Yeah, it's a yes. I'd like you both to address why neither of your budgets have a separate capital budget. It's been a long held debate. We've had uh, quite a long time about that. Cruel accounting. There's a lot of things. We we will invite you into these conversations. Are, are you from? Are you Boulder? Is that I am. Yes. I I would I would just argue that that. It, you know, of course, there's nuances in how they're done, but I would look to generally accepted accounting principles, look to some of what's done in the private sector school districts, and even if it's not done perfectly, and again, there's always reasonable disagreement about how to do it, I think it'll be more transparency and visibility than we currently have without any idea, uh, you know, kind of what the capital, what, what's capital and what's operating. It just, it just, you know, looking at figures, it just doesn't make much sense for me when you can't, you can't discern what's capital and what's operating. That's a good point. Thank you very much. This was almost as long as the budget committee markup, not quite. <laughs> uh, next year, next time we'll try to make it that long. Um, but I appreciate you, your being here, your, your uh, forbearance, and um, again, um, I appreciate you both. Um, and we'll have, a, we'll have a good debate on the floor tomorrow, and thank you very much for being here. Tonight. Tonight. Oh, tonight. That's why we've been antsy. Tonight. <laughs> tonight. Beginning tonight. Voting tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um.
I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Um, Scott and Ms. Lee are testifying together. And if we could also get, uh, you see Mr. Tiard, is he still? He's, let's try to, well, why don't you come up too as well? We'll try to get a, you guys will testify as a group here. Yeah. Who, who's left to testify? Mr. Jordan's here too. Yeah, Mr. Jordan as well. Yeah, he's on the committee. Uh, Mr. Jordan and uh, yeah. Mr. Jordan and Mr. Klein, I think we're here first. I've got that list. Yeah, oh, there it is. Uh, okay. Mr. Klein was waiting longest. He and Mr. Jordan were here earlier. I think that we better take them first. Well, we could. We, we, we could do it in the group. Well, all right, but they've been waiting here since okay. three o'clock. So we've been here for what? Two and a half hours. <laughs> But Mr. Klein and Mr. Jordan have waited all that time, and I think it's time we heard from them. Mr. Klein? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members, for letting us have a couple of minutes. And I'm going to say um, probably the, the most uh, dishonest words here on Capitol Hill. I'm going to be brief. Mm -hmm. But I am going to be brief today. I have a very simple amendment that I want to bring forward. I have been fascinated by the last two hours of conversation, and it's a shame that everybody in America hasn't heard this. But one of the things that I got out of this is this budget resolution is going to give some guidance and some direction to committees on how to spend money. So I have a, a simple uh, amendment that is, uh, expresses the sense of the House that Congress should fulfill the commitment it made in 1975 to provide 40 percent of the national average per pupil for special education. Madam Chair, it is unconscionable that since 1975, the federal government has been mandating every school in America provide education for children with special needs, special ed under IDEA. We were supposed to provide, by agreement, 40 percent of that funding. We have never come close. In about 2005, we almost hit 20 percent, almost half of what we're supposed to provide. So what my, my amendment does is provide the sense of the House that we should fund the 40% commitment that we made over 30 years ago. And that's, a, that's all it does. I'd like to submit my uh, comments for the record, and I will stand for questions or yield back. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on, on that. We have an amendment in the nature of a substitute, substitute budget brought forward by the Republican Study Committee. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the work you do and the, and the members of this committee, and, and particularly some of my we classmates and, and friends in the, um, my we gentleman, come up here York and and Colorado. Okay, wow. Well, <laughs> Two hours is, is, is plenty. Uh, the, uh, and, and our amendment does this. It's going to be a balanced budget. Um, I know folks on this side of the aisle weren't that enthused about Mr. Ryan's budget, so my guess is you're not kicking your heels up over uh, our proposal uh, either. But I will tell you this. Uh, three weeks ago on a Sunday afternoon, the first sunny Sunday afternoon of the spring in Ohio, 5,000 people showed up. Um, and I don't think they were necessarily Republicans or Democrats. I think they're just Americans who showed up in Cincinnati, Ohio, to say that they, they think this Congress, this government, needs to get spending under control. And that's what we attempt to do in our budget. Uh, it improves every single year and achieves a surplus in 2019. It declines, the national debt declines more than $6 trillion compared to the President's budget. We have tax relief of over a trillion dollars in this budget. We maintain the 0103 tax cuts, do the AMT patch, and also suspend the capital gains tax for two years. We do have to obviously address discretionary spending, which we do in here. We uh, freeze it, and then we do, and, and each year out, we do a 1% uh, cut in discretionary spending. Uh, we do keep, I thought it was an interesting discussion when you're talking about the safety net, uh, safety net out there, we do keep uh, the unemployment compensation that was in the, in the stimulus, uh, excuse me, package uh, in place. On the uh, mandatory side, we, uh, we do nothing to uh, Social Security. Oh, excuse me, let me go back. On, on discretionary spending, we also maintain the defense levels <coughs> and the... Um, and, and, and spending for, uh, for our, our veterans. On the mandatory side, we do nothing to Social Security. Um, we grow Medicare at uh, four, four times the rate of inflation. Medicaid grows at inflationary um, levels. Um, look, uh, the last thing I would say is this. There was a lot of talk in, in, the, in the previous discussion with uh, the chairman and the ranking member of the Budget Committee about uh, education. And one of the things that I, that, that I know is if, if you think to, back to your life, next to your parents, the, um, probably the person that had a big impact on your life was probably a teacher or coach. And for me, it was certainly the case. My, um, my high school wrestling coach, who was also the chemistry and physics teacher at our high school, was the toughest teacher in our school and the most demanding wrestling coach in the state. 
And he talked about discipline every stinking day of the year. And I got tired of hearing about it, as, as teenagers tend to do. But he had a great definition of discipline. He said, discipline is doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it. And basically, that meant doing things his way when you'd rather do them your way. It uh, meant doing things the right way when you'd rather do them the convenient way. This budget's not convenient that we bring forward, but we think it's a disciplined budget that makes the tough decisions, that gets our spending under control, so that we make sure we don't saddle our kids and grandkids with this debt that is building up. And I would, I would prefer not to have to make these cuts, but we're in a situation where when you look at where we're heading with the national debt and what we're going to do to our kids and grandkids, we think it's responsible to bring this forward, and that's why we're doing it. Um, I don't mean to say that you know, this, this committee is, is wrong if they don't like this, this, this proposal, but we think it's the right approach, and um, the Republican Study Committee felt strongly about bringing a proposal that actually balances, and that's, uh, that's our amendment. Very good. Are there any questions of these witnesses? I, I just have Mr. Comments. Sessions? Uh, first of all, Mr. Jordan, I believe that what we're doing is generational theft. That is taking an incredible amount of money today and saddling the future. Uh, and I, so I agree with you. Uh, Mr. Klein, thank you for being an advocate. Uh, uh, I sat in your place several years ago when I was on the budget committee. That's when we raised it from about 7 to 19 percent over three years or four. Uh, I understand disability issues pretty well as one of the co-chairmen of the uh, Down Syndrome Caucus and uh, uh, trying to be a leading edge person for uh, those with intellectual <coughs> disabilities uh, also. We need to we need to find a way to get as a goal. We may not get there right now, but somebody needs to glide path. So I think what your resolution is trying to say is at least show me that you're trying to get at it as opposed to just leaving the Thank you, Mr. Session. If I could just very briefly, but I believe that before we spend another dime on a new education program or expand other education expenses, we ought to meet this commitment that the government made over 30 years ago that, that will affect every school district in, in America. So I really think it's important that the budget that comes forward provide that direction and guidance that says we're going to meet that commitment. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. We thank appreciate you, it. Let me get started. Mr. T. Hart, you've been here longer. Are you here on a, uh, with anybody else or on a substitute? Not a substitute. All right, let, we can hear from you then. Uh, Ms. Woolsey, Ms. Lee, Ms. Scott, are you all together, the three of you? Um, Woolsey has progressive and you the CBC budget. Okay, Mr. Tiart, let's, uh, let's hear from you on your amendment. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. We've heard a, a lot of um, discussion about where we disagree on issues here, but I think I have an area where we can agree on. I don't think that any of us here in Congress want to see waste or fraud or abuse in the federal government. And knowing our schedules, it's very difficult for our committee chairman to schedule time for proper oversight. When we have a lot of agencies, uh, we're spending a lot of money, we have uh, very little time because of all the demands on our schedule to meticulously go through these programs and make comparative analysis to find out if they're doing what we intend them to do, if they're carrying out the will of this great body, and if they're doing it in an effective manner. What I have proposed is a commission of accountability that will review federal agencies and uh, point out areas where there is duplication, where there is waste, and if there is fraud, point that out as well. This will be a panel that will be appointed by the president. We will give them some time within two years to bring to the floor of the House for an up or down vote um, these agencies and these programs that are failing to meet the requirements that we had hoped they would meet when we put that into law. Um, every year, the OMB lists agencies that are not doing their job well. They would be prime targets for this organization to go to and say, All right, if you're not doing your job well, if you're not fulfilling the charter, the intent of Congress, then we're going to bring it to the floor for a vote. And they would have a chance to reform what they're doing and um, in either meet those demands or else come to a floor for a vote. I think it's where an area where we all would like to see the government do a better job. And I think this is an opportunity. It's called CARFA for short. Um, I think it's very straightforward. This um, uh, would be an amendment that I would request that you allow on the floor or if you saw fit incorporated in the manager's amendment 
Mm -hmm. And that would make it easier for all of us. All right. Thank so you, Mr. I, I would leave it for your discretion, but please consider the amendment. Thank, thank you, you very Mr. much. Any questions of Mr. T.R.? There are none. We thank you very much for uh, coming. And uh, let's see. Uh, Ms. Lee, I think you, Ms. Woolsey, actually was here first. <laughs> on my list. Is that correct? Why don't the three of you come up together? That would be fine. All right, who wants to go first? Uh, Barbara asked me to go first. All right. So thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for having me here today in this. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you for your patience, you really all of service you. service well up here every day and every We night. try. Um, as we face this huge challenge ahead of us, uh, the financial crisis, wars in two countries, uh, rising unemployment, crumbling infrastructure, lack of affordable health care, high energy prices, and global climate change, the budget, the budget be that we will be voting on is the legislation that will address all of these issues. That's why, as co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, uh, I'm pleased to present the fiscal year 2010 Progressive Caucus Budget Alternative. Uh, Madam Speaker, in November, the American people voted to take this country in a new direction, and that's what the CPC budget does. Not by making small adjustments, by, but, but by fundamentally changing the way that our government allocates its resources. That's why the CPC budget eliminates over $60 billion in unneeded spending at the Pentagon, much of which is spent on weapons designed to fight the Soviet Union, and it also cuts defense spending uh, by a total of $158 billion in fiscal year 2010. Defense spending needs to be brought under control. We know that. Uh, we spend more than uh, four times as much as China and eight times as much as Russia on, on uh, defense in this country. The CPC alternative budget saves another $8.7 billion a year by fully implementing the nearly 800 outstanding GAO recommendations to reduce waste, fraud, and uh, abuse at the DOD, and that was because of, of Barbara Lee's uh, initiation. Finally, we save another $90 billion by executing a timely and complete withdrawal of our troops from Iraq. The CPC budget also meets the challenges to restore fairness and balance to the tax code, which means rolling back the Bush tax breaks for the top 100, the top 1 percent, closing loopholes for corporations uh, equaling $100 billion a year, ensuring that Wall Street pays its fair share for the burden placed on taxpayers by the TARP program, and limiting, limiting the tax deductible deductibility of excessive CEO pay. Uh, uh, with these offsets, the CPC then sets forth an ambitious agenda to address the most pressing matters facing America today. We invest $991 billion in non-defense discretion, discretionary spending for fiscal year 2010. In fact, Mr. Klein would be very happy. We pay for IDEA 100 percent in our budget. And this is $469 billion over the President's budget. It is a, a bold infusion of resources that includes $300 billion in stimulus that, will, that uh, we feel was left out of the economic recovery package and increases domestic priorities that will ensure America's economic recovery. Uh, I'm not going to list all that it does because we don't have time, but I have it in my written statement to you. Uh, but we feel certain that this is a good uh, statement for people who want to pass a progressive caucus budget that uh, we've laid out for you because it will come before us, uh, I hope, tomorrow if you allow that. And we will be able to make a statement about defense spending and taking those funds and spending it on uh, humanitarian needs in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Would you like your full statement to appear in the record? Yes, please. And without objection, we'll do that. Ms. Lee? 
Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And I'm going to be very um, short and just ask that my uh, statement be uh, Without put, with, put into the record. But uh, let, me, let me thank you again for the opportunity to be with you and to discuss the priorities of the Congressional Black Caucus's budget. But also let me thank Congressman Bobby Scott and his staff for his uh, work in support of our budget and its goals for this year. And let me just say, uh, in listening to the debate earlier, we believe that uh, a budget is more than uh, numbers. It really is a moral document. It reflects who we are as a country and defines our values as a country. And so now we have the opportunity really to uh, reshape our budget priorities. And it's time now to aggressively advance the role of government to empower and protect the American public. Thank you very much, thank Madam you, Chair Ms. and um, Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, the Congressional Black Caucus budget believes that the historic investments outlined in the President's budget and the Democratic Committee budget our excellent blueprints to continue our road towards economic recovery and a return to fiscal responsibility. The CBC commends Chairman Spratt for his work on the House budget resolution, which reinstates PAYGO and makes fiscally responsible investments for the future. And I assure you that the Congressional Black Caucus fully, is fully behind the President in the majority's budget as far as it goes. However, this Congressional Black Caucus budget builds upon the President's budget and the committee budget by budgeting for modest spending increases above the committee, uh, committee budget. Many members of the Democratic Caucus believe that the remaining Bush era, uh, Bush era tax cuts that disproportionately benefited the wealthy Americans should be immediately repealed rather than wait for these tax cuts to expire at the end of 2010. In fact, even Speaker Pelosi has indicated that position. Over the last, and publicly indicated that position. Over the last eight years, these tax cuts have cost the American people hundreds of billions of dollars, all the while the promised benefits of trickle down economics never materialized. The CBC budget immediately repeals the tax cuts for those, for that portion of a person's income, over $200,000 for single filers and over $250,000 for joint filers rather than letting them expire. The CBC budget also eliminates the phase out and repeal of what is called PEP and P's involving uh, standard deductions and itemized, uh, itemized deductions and the standard, uh, standard deduction. These important tax provisions were part of the Omnibus Reconciliation Act of 1990 signed by the first President Bush and assured that people were paying their fair share of taxes. Together, repealing the provis provisions in 2001 and 2003 um, that repealing what we did in 2001 and 2003 would yield an estimated $42 billion in additional revenue for 2010. In addition, we add a new Bush debt tax, which adds an extremely modest, about half a percent surtax on that portion of a person's income exceeding $500,000 for individuals and a million dollars for joint filers, and we propose to use that for def exclusively for deficit reduction. The CBC takes these savings and applies them towards increased investments in important functions of the budget that will help lead to an even more prosperous future. Uh, future. It adds $18 billion for health care, $17 billion for education and job training, $8 billion for transportation, over $5 billion for administration of justice, $5 billion for international affairs, almost $5 billion for income security, $4.5 billion for veterans benefits. The CBC pays for all of these and still produces a budget deficit, which is $67 billion lower than the committee budget and saves the American people $7 billion in net interest alone. Madam Chair, I hope that we will make these investments. Uh, I, having listened to the debate earlier, Madam Chairman, I just needed to make a couple of other uh, comments as we were lectured by the other side of the aisle. We were reminded that in 93 we passed the budget that, uh, was actu that actually worked in 1993. That budget produced 20 million jobs over the next eight years, uh, increased uh, median, med med median wage, uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average more than tripled, and we eliminated the debt and created a su sufficient surplus that by last year we could have eliminated the debt held by the public. In 2001, we went in a different direction, directly into the ditch. Uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average ended up after eight years worse than it started. Median income adjusted for inflation is actually down. The um, uh, surplus and the number of jobs is the worst job performance since the Great Depression. And the surplus we had was eliminated and replaced by a huge 
um, uh, by huge debt. Uh, some have suggested that um, part of the 90s, we had a Republican Congress, but I would re remind, since we're talking about not rewriting history, remind people that when they came in in 1995, they attempted to undo the 93 budget. Uh, President Clinton vetoed that budget, even allowed the government to get closed down rather than sign their budgets. And so the 93 budget remained in place the next eight years. If you want to know what would happen if he had signed it, we know in 2001 what happened. We went directly into the ditch. This Congressional by Caucus budget adopts the economic policies and theories that we adopted in 1993 and rejects those that were adopted in, 19, in, in 2001. I would hope that we would uh, adopt the budget, get back on the right track, and make the appropriate investments in our future. Thank you all very much. Are there any questions of these witnesses, Mr. Sessions? Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you so very much. Notwithstanding, uh, I disagree with that uh, characterization. I'd like to ask all three of you, or perhaps two or three of you, uh, Ms. Lee, if you want to answer, or Mr. Scott. Uh, I've been uh, approached uh, as I was doing my due diligence on the budget by a group of people interested in the Department of Peace or the Peace Department. I don't know whether it's the Department of Peace or the Peace Department. Uh, is that in your budget? Can you tell me about it? Well, let me say, as one of the um, original co-sponsors of the Department of Peace, uh, I don't believe it's in the budget. I wish it were in the budget. In your budget? Yeah, I don't believe we have Which this in uh, the it, budget it, at all. But uh, I think personally it should be. We need a Department of Peace to begin to address conflict resolution, uh, peaceful approaches to solving conflicts, mediation both here on the streets of America with regard to domestic violence also, but also in terms of a global type of uh, department that would address peace. It's not in the CBC. No, it's not in the CBC okay. budget. No, the, uh, the, the, um, we do have some additional investments from the Department of State that can make investments in um, uh, cultural exchanges and things like that, significant uh, investments that could do some of the things that the Department of Peace would do. And uh, the Congressional Progressive, con, con, the Congressional Progressive uh, Budget does not uh, have the Department of Peace in it, nor do any of the budgets n title. Of, of programs that I know of, but what we do is invest much more heavily into uh, diplomacy, uh, prevention, international uh, uh, cooperation, all of which leads to what should be peace, and, a, uh, and we do believe that a Department of Peace is uh, one of the uh, new thoughts that this nation of ours ought to be supporting, because we have a Department of defense. We had a Department of War. Why not a Department of Peace so we can stop spending all this foolish money to bully people around uh, militarily? Let's work with them. Any other questions? Madam Chair, Thank you. Could I introduce uh, an outline that goes into detail as to exactly what the assumptions are? Without objection, certainly. And thank you all very much. Mr. Cassidy? You'll come up. Mr. Cassidy, you can summarize your statement, if you please, and the entire statement will appear in the record, um, or you may present it any way you choose. I feel like I should present it like an auctioneer with the uh, alarm going off, but uh, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Madam Chairwoman, um, the President's budget assumes new revenue from at least eight separate tax hikes, specifically on domestic oil and gas. And I'm assuming because your budget we're considering today has even higher revenue sources that um, it makes me think these same energy tax increases are intended. Now, John Marshall said the power to tax is the power to destroy. Tax hikes create uncertainty, and uncertainty creates caution, and caution inhibits economic activity. And I say this because the people that will be most affected by this will be the welders and the pipe fitters and the rig workers that are sometimes not even with, the, with a high school education and never with a college education, earning $70,000 a year with, with benefits and able to provide for their family. Now, this is a domestic energy. This is a domestic industry, which um, by its very nature cannot be moved overseas. 
And these are folks whose employment options might otherwise be limited. So my amendment would create a point of order against tax increases that cause American job loss in the oil and gas sector or increases America's dependence on foreign oil and would also prevent such tax increases from being used in reconciliation bills. And I'm not naive. I know that's not the, the spirit of this Congress. But I also know the spirit of this Congress is very much for the working person. And this bill is not for the fat cats. This bill is for those folks that make their living doing work that provides them with a living wage that they otherwise will not have access to. Thank you very much, Mr. Cassidy. Are there any questions, comments? Yes. Mr. Cassidy, Mr. Sessions? Uh, bill, welcome to the Rules Committee. Is this your first trip here? Um, it is. Well, how nice to have you, Mr. Cassidy. Thank you. What a, a nice day for you to come. You know, I... Uh, We've been here a long time. It doesn't give me it doesn't give me comfort that the chairwoman's last name is Slaughter, but we'll let that go. <laughs> that just means I'm tough. <laughs> well, but glad, fair. I'm glad you're here, and and your story that you told me reminded me of a, of a story that happened with uh, the Clinton tax increase, uh, luxury tax that really decimated uh, Louisiana. Would that be kind of the example of what you're talking about? Mr. Sessions, absolutely. I went to a rig this past week, and everybody out there is a working class person, except yeah. for the person taking me around who's, who's the geologist. And these are the jobs that are going to be lost. Rig workers who um, uh, really, they don't have a college education, and they don't have computer skills, but they know how to work that rig. And in so doing, they, they, they contribute to our energy independence. And so um, uh, this is a domestic, a domestic industry that provides work for hardworking people who don't have the training that you and I may have. I guess I'm curious about it, Chair. How is it? Would you gentlemen... I, I would yield to the gentleman from Florida. How do you account Florida. for Norway being able to have rigs and all of the extraordinary taxes that they have as a, a country? How, how, how did that happen? Those people don't know it's their job. Well, a couple of things. First, I will say that Louisiana workers were among those that trained those Norwegian workers. And so that's kind of a point of pride with our folks. But you have to say, excuse me just a minute, these are the same persons that you were saying are just salt of the earth, et cetera, et cetera. There's different levels. So the man I went out with is a safety engineer. And so he would be the person going over to Norway to help say, OK, this is how you avoid a blowout. That's number one. But number two, the uh, wells we're talking about are not like they have in Saudi Arabia that put out 20,000 barrels in an hour or a day. These are that put out two to 300 barrels in a day. And so the production is not nearly as voluminous as it is in high production uh, rigs such as off Norway. And, and there your profit margin is much greater. So therefore, you don't quite need the support from, say, the tax code as you would need in our domestic wells, which sometimes have played out. Uh, but they still have some reserves. So I'll carry it on. Yes. All right. Um, Mr. Sessions. Mr. Gentleman, thank you. Uh, Reclaiming my time. The gentleman brought up uh, an interesting point. Is, is Norway, uh, is that a private industry or is that run by the government? Socialized? I'm not quite sure about that, Mr. Sessions. I, I think it's run by the government. Is it? Uh, so a socialized uh, yeah. system. So they so, have an automatic subsidy. Right. No wonder they're successful. Right. So, or at least so it's sad. Any other comments, questions? Did the gentleman say socialism is always successful? No, I did not. I, I, what I said was, no wonder it was successful. Because of socialism? Uh, we were looking at how successful it is. I was in reference to, I guess that's the reason why. All the experience. There are no further questions, it appears, Mr. Cassidy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Ms. Watson, do we have time to hear Ms. Watson before? We have, we've got votes on the floor. Uh, we're almost at the end of the 15 minutes for the first one. We still have how many? We have 173, but we just tried to get a couple minutes. We can go ahead and hear Ms. Watson. Okay, Ms. Watson. Thank you so very much. After that, let me tell you, when we go down to vote, we will recess and come back and finish the bill at, as soon as you do the last vote. The fourth vote, please come back up. Mm -hmm. 
Madam Chairwoman, thank you for the opportunity to testify before this most esteemed committee on my proposed amendment to the House Concurrent Resolution 85. On January 17, 1961, President Dwight D. Eisenhower gave his farewell address to the nation after serving two terms. He warned the American people of the insidious growth of our nation's defense industry and stated in part the following. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence or the sought or unsought by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together." Unquote. The amendment that I'm proposing will prevent the use of supplemental appropriations to fund any uh, contingency operation related to any branch of the uniformed services. Contingency operations such as Iraq and Afghanistan have been mainly funded through the use of supplemental appropriations. The use of this funding mechanism has resulted in billions of dollars either missing or still unaccounted for. To date, Congress has allocated more than $600 billion for the conflict in Iraq, most of it through supplemental off-budget appropriations. The use of supplemental spending to finance the war is a threat to the democratic processes President Eisenhower warned us about such a long time ago. Without properly vetting the actual cost of war in the appropriation process and failing to provide the proper oversight on how and where these funds are spent, Congress has wasted billions of taxpayers' dollars. The use of supplemental appropriations has resulted in many cases of waste, fraud, and abuse. If these conflicts in Iraq or Afga Afghanistan were budgeted through the normal process, we could have avoided the waste of billions of dollars. For instance, in 2003, when troops entered Baghdad, the Coalition Provisional Authority was established. Soon thereafter, $9 billion in cash went unaccounted for. There were no banks or wire transfers to pay contractors and no um, bean counters to keep track of all the money. And all there were were bank vaults and footlockers stuffed with billions of dollars in cash. The money was a mixture of Iraqi oil revenues, uh, war booty, and U.S. government funds earmarked by the CPA. Frank Willis, who was the number two man at the CPA's Ministry of Transportation, said it was really the wild, wild west. Whenever cash was needed, someone went down to the vault with a wheelbarrow or a gunny sack and just took money. Willis explained that on August 1, 2003, $100,000 worth of bricks of 100 bills totaling $2 million were used to pay a company called Custer Battles, which was a security contractor responsible for providing security at the Baghdad International Airport. As a result of this wild, wild west spending, we have not seen the results that we would have liked to see in Iraq because there was, near, uh, there was no clear focus or plan for spending appropriate funding. The United States will leave Iraq, we hope, in 2011 without the, the capacity to continue the necessary development to keep Iraq stable. If Congress would have been specific about how taxpayers' dollars would have been spent, our nation would likely not be in the current situation we're in. So, Madam Chairwoman, thank you so much for allowing me to propose my amendment, which will limit 
the use of supplemental appropriations for contingency operations. And I welcome yes. any questions you or other members of the committee may have. I really think we're going to have to recess. Yes. Go. Are there any questions for Ms. Watson? Okay. And that closes the hearing portion on this matter. Okay. We will come back up Thank to you report so out. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I move the committee report a resolution uh, providing for further consideration of H. Um, uh, Con Res 85, the concurrent resolution on the budget for fiscal year 2010 under a structured rule. Uh, the concurrent resolution shall be considered as read. The rule makes in order only those amendments uh, printed in the Rules Committee report accompanying the resolution. Each amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated, and shall be considered as read. <coughs> Each amendment is debatable for 40 minutes, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent. Uh, the resolution waives all points of order against the amendments made in order. Uh, the adoption of any amendment in the nature of a substitute shall constitute the completion of consideration of the concurrent resolution uh, for amendment. The resolution also permits the chair of the committee on the budget to offer amendments uh, to achieve mathematical consistency. Finally, the resolution provides that it shall be in order after adoption of H. Um, uh, Conrad's 85 uh, for the speaker to take from the table S. Conrad's 13 and to consider S. Conrad's 13 in the House without intervention of any point of order. It shall be in order to move without, any, uh, without intervention of any point of order to strike all after the resolving clause of A.S. Con Res uh, 13 and insert in lieu thereof uh, the provisions of H. Con Res 85 as passed by the House. If the motion and Senate uh, concur, concurrent resolution are adopted, it shall be in order to move uh, that the House insist on its amendment and request a conference with the Senate. I thank the gentleman. Uh, you have heard the motion of the gentleman from uh, Florida. As you can tell, that uh, I think all the major substitutes were made in order. But if, is there any discussion or any amendments? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dreyer. Mr. Chairman, I have, uh, I have several amendments mm -hmm. here. But I know we've had a long afternoon with lots of uh, discussion and, and all. And so I'm going to... Um, I'm going to ask for a uh, recorded vote, and I'd, I'd like to consider them in block, and I uh, don't think anyone will object to that. So let me, let me first uh, say uh, I, I move that the committee make an order all, uh, make an order and provide the appropriate waivers for all amendments submitted to the Rules Committee for House Concurrent Resolution 85, that they be separately debated and considered. So I'll do that one. Thank you. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Uh, any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the Dreyer Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can you, the chair, the no's have it? Mr. Chairman, uh, now what I'm going to do is uh, I have several amendments here, and I uh, am going to ask that they be considered in block, and so I'm going to go through these amendments, and then I'll ask for a recorded vote on uh, one recorded vote on all of them out of respect to my very, very long-suffering and patient colleagues on the uh, other we side. We appreciate that very much. Well, I spend my life trying to accommodate you all in every way that I possibly can. So let me uh, say that uh, I move that the committee make an order and provide the appropriate waivers for amendment number 24 offered by Representative Chaffetz of Utah. And um, the, uh, make, to make an order amendment number 5 offered by Representative Lance of New Jersey. Amendment number 10 offered by Representative Klein of Minnesota. Amendment number 21 offered by Representative Cassidy of Louisiana. Amendment number 11 offered by Representatives Harper of Mississippi and Austria of Ohio. Uh, amendment number 18 offered by Representative Mike Rogers of Alabama. And amendment number 14 offered by Representative Brown Waite of Florida. You've heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? The gentleman, uh, Mr. Perlmutter. 
tradition, but there's nothing to prevent the Rules Committee from actually making amendments in order, and I'm simply proposing these amendments as uh, an option for this committee to consider. And there is precedent for amendments having been made in order, uh, you know, in the, in the past. We've made an order, uh, a, an amendment offered by Mr. Obey and, uh, and, uh, and others in the past, so it's not unprecedented, but I'm making this request to the committee. Mr. Yeah. Chairman? Yeah, uh, gentlemen for Florida, Mr. Mr. Hayes. Mr. Chairman, uh, during uh, the discussion, I uh, uh, was absent to go to the Intelligence Committee for uh, a hearing for about an hour. And I missed an opportunity uh, for a bit of levity that I would like to add now. Uh, people that know me well uh, know that I was um, 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 very uh, supportive of uh, my mother's humor. And um, she um, uh, kept me going. And some, some, some of the people that work with me say I should write a book about things that my mama said. Uh, but among the things she said to me when I came home once uh, was, you all keep talking about who caused all of these problems. She said, you know, uh, 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 Clinton says that Bush did it, and Bush says that Carter did it, and Carter says that Reagan did it, and Reagan said that Nixon did it, and it just goes, she said, well, why don't you all just, uh, if you're going to use this relating back, just say George Washington did it and get it all over with yeah. at once, <laughs> you understand, exactly. or maybe King James. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the gentleman yield, I'd just like to join the, the litany of people who would encourage you to uh, pen that tome, uh, because I've heard many of uh, your mother's brilliant, brilliant uh, statements quoted here in the past. And, and personally, and she was a very wise woman. And uh, I suspect that she would probably join you in blaming Nixon, Reagan, <laughs> and every other Republican, uh, rather than going all the way back to I, George I Washington. Was I think she did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She did. No, 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 I didn't. I just wondered if she, if, but, but I'm saying that I suspect that she might have. She, she created Yellow Dog Democrat. Uh-huh. <laughs> OK, so in other words, then, as I said, it would have been Nixon, Reagan, Bush that she would have uh, joined you uh, in blaming, I suspect. Without but to clean it up, she said we should all go back to the father <coughs> of our great nation. Uh, that's, a, that's a great idea. Mr. Well, I would encourage my friend to vote in support of my amendment if he'd uh, Mr. Cardoso. So um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I fully recognize that Mr. Dreyer's correct that there is precedent for doing this. However, uh, I believe that we need to have full uh, substitutes present to the committee to put on the floor. I think it, it, it makes the debate something that is easier to define and is better for the purposes of the discussion. Uh, while there may be some very good amendments in here, they may be very choice. I think it's important that they be included in some kind of substitute for the purposes of the work we have to get done. And so while I have some paper for Joe's motion, I don't intend to go for it. And I get to remind everybody that there are uh, four substitutes made in order. Uh, Chairman, let me just, uh, if I might, I'd just, I just, I would say that uh, the budget that is before us from the committee is entitled a new direction. And since we're already looking for that, um, I think that maybe we might consider a new direction when it comes to the work of the Rules Committee and, in fact, create an opportunity for a number of these members to offer their proposals, as has been the case in years past. Although I, I did uh, recognize that it is somewhat unusual, but uh, I still think that it might be part of a nice new direction Thank we you. take. Uh, no more. You know, uh, any other discussion? Being none, the vote now occurs on the motion of the gentleman from California. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Be a chair. The have a record vote, Mr. Chairman. Let's call the roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. No. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Curry. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Ms. Henry. No. Mr. Polis. Mr. Gerard. Aye. Mr. Dewey Gillard. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Dr. Fox. Madam Chair. Clerk will report the total. Two yeas, seven yeas. Amendments not agreed to. Any further amendments? Nope. Being none, the vote now occurs in the motion of the gentleman from Florida. Mr. Hastings, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Being in the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And this will be carried by me. And this will be carried by me. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have
have a good discussion. Rules Committee stands adjourned. The House started debate on the budget resolution on Wednesday and